Tom Hall, welcome to Tech Talk with Daniel. Thank you. Excited to be here. You know, Commander Keen played a significant part in me trying to convince my parents to buy me a VGA screen. At that point in time, I had a monochrome Hercules graphics card. Yeah. So even though I could run most of the point and click adventure games of that era, I couldn't run Commander Keen. So I wanted to thank you for helping me shoot for the stars by having <laughs> no choice but to upgrade to VGA. The challenging, I mean, it was an EGA game, but yeah, it was a little more beefy than some of the other, yeah, other it titles. Yeah, the Hercules about. game. So yeah, that if I is had true. to upgrade to something, it would be to VGA. Yeah, make that leap. Anyway, let's start at the beginning. How did you get into programming? All right, so... I was like a both an introvert and a creative kid. So early on, you know, I was doing like origami and magic and building little marble mazes when I was a kid. And then I got older and I started writing fiction and poetry and started doing Super 8 movies and that kind of stuff. And I was, you know, interested in all these media and, and I made some songs to see what that was like to make those. And then, and then, um, I, I remember the day my dad got, on uh, June 9th, 1980, my dad got an Apple II Plus computer. And I just lived on that thing all summer because, like, it was such a open platform as opposed to a lot of computers that were obfuscated. It was a very easy to use. There was hardly any documentation for it, but... You know, there's basic and you can learn assembly and, and there was tons of fun games. And then I started making with some text adventures and then like I had made short films and made uh, short stories and, and also, but it seemed like there was, you know, everybody was doing those media and like making a super eight film, like you're going to need a crew eventually and you need a lot more technical expertise around that. And I was reading all the cinema effects and cinema fantastique magazines at the time but on the computer what i my text adventures were basically as, as good as the ones that were being published and if i had a little more ambition as a 16 year old i should have published them anyway i did later uh but like i could make a whole experience for a person like i could you know communicate through this medium uh all by myself in a way that I couldn't do with the other medium. And so I was like, Hey, this is really cool. And, and sort of the similar time frame, just a little bit before that, I think, uh, I, my brother had given me $5 or quarters for my birthday, I think, cause his friend worked in the arcade and those were borrowed quarters. But anyway, <laughs> that's my theory. I haven't asked him, but, uh, anyway, I was playing Seawolf, you know, it's that you got the periscope and, you know, shooting boats. And I was getting really good at it, you know, shooting boats before they came on screen. And I got to the end of the bonus round and I, you know, bam, bam, bam. I did really well. And I was leaving the arcade and I went like, wait a second. I am shooting boats before they came on screen. It's just a pattern. I can't shoot any more boats than I did. I guess I'm done. Like, and that kind of demystified video games for me. Like, oh, somebody just made this and made a pattern of boats and made it challenging and that was it. You know, and just like, huh, man, well, maybe this is a doable thing. It's not like this mystical, you know, lights on your TV. It's like somebody made this, you know. And so the combo of the two things, uh, along with getting an Atari 2600 for Christmas, is just sort of like, you know, triple triple KO punch <laughs> to uh, sort of lead me in that direction. And and I couldn't believe we got Atari 2600 for Christmas because it was a big red present. And I just opened it. And I, you know, oh, my gosh, it's Atari 2600. That's $150. Oh, my gosh. So all, all those things were just, like, really pointing me, like, wow, this is a new thing, and I can do it myself. And it's very empowering. And, and I get to make these experiences, which – keep coming through my brain so that's how i began and how soon after you got your computer did you write your first game uh it was well what i did initially was i had this book called strate or 
stimulating simulations or something. It was a really dodgy name for, but it's a little yellow book and it had basic programs in it. And in the time we'd get magazines and we type in little programs people made, but this one had like sort of cool little fun little games. And there's one called like treasure hunt or lost treasure or something like that. Lost treasure. And I typed that in and then I thought, well, you know, maybe I could, you know, change the names, the locations, or maybe I could change how it works a little bit. And like, oh, maybe I could add, add graphics and make simple rooms. So from that lost treasure game, I made this game called Gold Quest, which was, you know, kind of going around and make, finding my own treasure. And then I changed it to a high res thing where you're trying to track down a murderer. And then you keep getting, occasionally you'll, you'll wander around the city and you'll get phone calls at a phone booth. And I'm like, he's on, you know, he's by the park. And I think you have to go over by the park. Uh, and then there was this really bad, bad diamond headed murderer with like a, a stick knife, uh, if you found him. But, but that sort of was just a little, riff off of somebody else's game since it was just, you know, a type in game. But that let me know like, oh, you know, this is how games work. And, you know, I see what they did here to make, you know, a core thing and that you keep coming back to. And and that sort of like opened up the idea. And af- after that, I just made like, I don't know, but before I got even like sort of my early industry job, I had made like 50 little games at that time. And in what programming language did you use to create these games? Uh, initially, uh, AppleSoft Basic, which was just a normal Basic uh, for the Apple II. But uh, eventually, you started like getting people's like we had what they call them subroutines, but they were they're just basically like here's a sound function and uh, here's a thing that draws you know letters on the screen as opposed to the like, normal letters you you draw uh, in graphics, and then. Uh, here's something that draws what we used to call block shapes, which are, you know, like basically just a normal sprite. And so like you start piecing together these things and you're like, well, maybe I'll make something of my own. So I made a little routine that kind of rolled pinball numbers, you know, they roll forward uh, and various other things. So eventually I sort of like started liking the speed of assembly language, which was hard to do until they came out with the Merlin assembler. And then it was, much easier to do because there was something you could type labels and code in rather than entering numbers and what's called a mini assembler. It was like really primitive. However, there are famous uh, game developers back at the time, like Nazar Kabali, who actually like thought out the entire code of their game in their head, dictated to someone, and then they typed in those hex codes, those basically two digit hex numbers and, and like, that was the game. And uh, yeah, he's, a, he's a brilliant uh, genius guy who later worked on uh, the Final Fantasy game, the early ones. Now, as a game developer myself, I know the, the excitement of working on a new idea or trying to figure out interesting ways in which you can implement a certain gameplay mechanic. But I also know that that excitement wears out pretty quickly when you have to deal with actually finishing these games. Was it, was it the same for you starting out? Well, luckily mine were very scoped down. I, I don't know why I, I just made a little nugget. I think it's cause I like to show stuff off to friends or my parents or, or so on or family. And so I'd get like a cool small thing. It's like, oh, I could get approbation from this cool small thing. And in a way, I trained myself to scope down uh, because of that. And and uh, the thing I, I mean, we can talk about this later, but the thing I like to do just for fun nowadays is make little games in Pico 8, which is like a fantasy console. And it's basically a, someone, a uh, guy named Zap just, uh made a set of tools for a console that never existed. And so you program in Lua and the Lua, like a code editor is built in, sprite editor, sound effects and music editor are built in. And it feels like the old days. It feels like, wow, you know, I'm empowered to just make little things and the the constraints are very small. It's like a 32K game. Uh, But you get to play in little retro graphics and, and it's a, great thing to like noodle out an idea in. So like, I can even like test out, you know, 
system design or like a, a little mechanic that I was curious about or something. And that's a, that's a fascinating thing to someone actually, of course, made doom in it, which is impossible, but somehow they smashed doom into that little tiny, uh, virtual fantasy console. It's called Poom because it's in peak weight. So, Recommend people check that out if they want to try to get into games and their past scratch. <laughs> well, nowadays you can play Doom on your toilet, so... And many people do. And many people do. <laughs> so, do you remember all of the games you created in that time period? Uh, I have a list of them somewhere. Luckily, I kind of wrote down all of them while I still have access to my Apple II disk. I, I have a virtual ac- Apple II drive that I have to like get all my old discs on, but you have one shot at that because I'm sure the media is decaying as we speak. So hopefully a number of them saved or survived. However, um, a lot of those text adventures were, um, were preserved. Yeah, that's one of them. Were preserved uh, on softest because they bought all my old text adventures and a few of the things. Death Ships for the Ninth Galaxy, which is... Why do you remember about Death Ships from the Ninth uh, Galaxy? That, that is a deep cut. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> but basically I made a bad Apple II game. So the joke is, like, you're just, you know, a, a normal, like, or Galaxian or, or Space Invader ship on the bottom. And the Death Ships, you know, they look ominous. There's five huge ships up here. But they don't fire or anything. They just sit there for you to shoot them. So it's like the joke is like they're death ships from that ice galaxy, but they actually don't do anything. So the only danger is you shoot them, they explode, and the pilot falls, and you have to not get hit by the pilot. So <laughs> that's it. And you shoot five of them, and it's like, hey, you did it. You know that. So it's like it sounds so big, but it's very small. <laughs> sounds awesome. I have no way about you. <laughs> yeah. But somebody, yeah, I, I think I mentioned that, and then somebody made the cover for it. Like, it's, so it's the the most produced cover of any of my early games for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Did it take more time to produce the cover than to produce the actual game? I would pretty much guarantee that yes. Like, probably <laughs> about the time of choosing the font, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So how did you land the job of assistant editor at uh, SoftDisk? So I went to college and I like working on a computer. So I got a degree in computer programming, which, which is easy. And I, when I went to assembly class, I smoked that class because I had already done assembly on the Apple II. So it was just like a different processor so i was like here's this here's this i'll do the extra credit i think i got 104 in the class or something <laughs> it was like well this is just like playing around but uh it was got a degree in computer programming and then i interviewed at like ibm and gould and all those you know big computer companies and they said we like you we like your resume but is this what you really want to do and i went back home from the plant trips and it's like no, this is boring. I want to make games because, like, I had made uh, some software for a teacher friend of mine who taught the term what at that time was learning disabled kids, not like differently abled or whatever. But uh, because they they needed simpler programs to to interact with, so I made a thing with a guy in a little piggy bank walking around Eddie and Eddie has really long arms. So he reaches up and he gets change off the top of the screen. So there's a quarter, a dime, a nickel, a penny and say it makes 37 cents. So Eddie goes over and you know reaches up and it was just arrows and space bar. So it was very simple controls. They could get that. And so that was later published on Softus for no reason. I don't know why, but, but, uh, but that, that taught me like, wow, it's, you know, heartwarming to make something that really helps people learn and, and so on. And, and doing it through a medium of games was great. Uh, but so when I was doing this boring job or the interviewed for boring job, uh, and necessary, but boring, uh, I, ju- I just, that was not interesting. It's like, I want to make games. So I sent out 50 resumes 
I got 50 rejections. Ah, so I kind of waited for a month or two until the next quarter or something to see if maybe, you know, that was kind of like heading into Christmas. So it's like, no one's going to hire you at that point. So I waited till the spring, uh, sent out 27 more and I got one back that said, Oh my gosh, you're the perfect person. We need to interview you. Please, you know, consider it. So. That was in soft disk in Louisiana. So I flew down there and they, and they were, they're ecstatic. I had so much Apple soft basic experience and an assembly experience. And so like, this is great. And, and really the, the salary was like a third of what I would have gotten at the boring job, but I got to play around in an Apple II all month. That was like a dream job, you know, like I can survive and eat bologna sandwiches if I have to, <laughs> you know, it was exciting. And then, so it was like kind of working at McDonald's, the McDonald's of gaming, you know, you just make a monthly software collection every month, do a little bit of your own or polish up submissions from sort of the readers of the magazine on disc. Uh, and that was great. And, and so you work really hard, you know, for little pay, but boy, you know, you really got a lot of experience at just shipping something. And, and that happened to be a great place to meet other people of similar interests. So Southdisk was your first paid job as a programmer? That is correct. So I, I went, I, I worked at like McDonald's or something <laughs> to buy a stereo or something, but, uh, yeah, that was the first time I got a job programming and and, and game developing. It was kind of like make a spreadsheet, you know, make a utility, and then occasionally make a game. Kind of. And what was your first day at Softdisk like? Uh, that was well. It was interesting because I got down there and did to the interview, and Softdisk was in uh, like a offices made out of a former mechanic's garage. So like the, the the parking lot was on top of it and there were like two garages still and then the offices were kind of littered behind there. And so it was like leaky and 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 really there's only like one thing to do downtown Shreveport, which was the Strand Theater, which is a cool theater. It's a classic old timey theater. Uh but apart from that, it was just like kind of like depressed areas. So we got down there, but uh I was hired by this guy, Jim Weiler, and he was super great boss, like r really sort of, you know, taught me the ropes of the job and, you know, let me shine up what I wanted to do and published, you know, my previous games. And so that was, that was a pretty cool thing, but, uh, there was kind of like a cultural shock because I, I grew up in Wisconsin and well, Louisiana kind of has uh, when certain people aren't in the room, racism. <laughs> uh, and that was like, like, why did you bother saying that? You know, like, yeah. So I, I thought that was kind of shocking. But apart from that, I mean, there's a bunch of just really cool people. And, and obviously that was uh, the, what sort of like a, meeting place for the future id folk. And what was the first project you were assigned to at Softdisk? Well, uh, I don't know. They, they were just numbered, like, issue 78. Uh, the earliest thing I can remember is I somebody submitted sort of like Monopoly-like game called Magic Boxes, and so I made it nicer and used, you know, like, we called it Font Generator, which is, you know, something that printed graphical fonts on the high risk screen and so on and this kind of cleaned it up had, had cool sound effects and and so kind of polished it up to to production level and you you basically took his work and and expanded on it yeah now it was either magic boxes or the seven keys the seven keys might be that one magic boxes was i think a math in two directions program that's what but yeah, awesome. those were the two early ones, yeah. And when was the idea to have a bi-monthly disc magazine first discussed? Well, ours was monthly, and then Big Blue was monthly, and Commodore was monthly. Uh, but uh, after a certain while, our competitor, Uptime, folded. And we're like, oh, 
uh, you know, that maybe they have some, they do exactly what we do. You know, there's probably some good submitters or, or people devs on there that we could hire. And at the same time, we were getting these cool submissions, uh, from one of our submitters on the Apple II disk. So uptime wise, we thought, Oh, I think there's this one, uh, submitter that, you know, probably does their best games. Let's get that guy. And that was John Romero. And so we <laughs> offered him a job and he, he came over and he said, well, I'll, I'll join you, but I want to do like a game a month disc. And I uh, don't want to do these big collection things or something like that. And then, uh, but he needed, you know, another coder to uh, start that up. So uh, we had a cool submitter uh, who had done a, tennis game and this RPG called Wraith and they were they were pretty cool. So we said like, hey, you know, why don't you why don't you come join us, you know, come down here from Kansas City and and that was Carmack. But he didn't want to do it right away. And then so Romero kept like, come on, dude, come on over. It's like, no, I think I'm gonna stick it out. And eventually Carmack was like, well, okay, money's kind of tight, I'll come over. And so uh they ended off and they were they were starting up the games disc, but the the guy that was the managing editor of that disc wasn't really working out. He wanted to like stay in C or something like or stay in assembly or something. I think it was assembly. Uh but it's a lot faster obviously to code in C and so on. And so and you know, they were kind of just rubbing up the department and uh, so I, since I was only getting occasionally to make games, I w- and they are both Apple II heads. I just went over there and say, like, "Oh my God, let's talk Apple II stuff." So we get we're geeking out about Apple II stuff, and then they're like, "Hey, what are you guys doing?" Oh, I'm doing this game. It's like, "Hey, I'll, you know, when we do the levels or you know the graphics, it's like, sure." And so we so we kind of like I would go there and work a second job at night, doing like the game design and and there and and so on. And that we just worked together really well. So, you know, we even, they asked to have me switch to that department, but I was heading up a disc or two in the other department. So it was like, no, we can't. It's like, well, I'll just, you know, kibitz anyway, because it was really fun to do. And yeah, so that, that sort of became, you know, three of the four uh, original soft diskers became, you know, pre, pre ed buddies. Even that you had two jobs over there, did you also get double the pay? Nope. <laughs> I did not. I mean, it was just, I mean, I just got to have fun as far as I consider. It's like, wow, you know, really getting to make games all the time was fantastic. It's sort of the dream. So however I need to do that. And so that was just, you know, fun. And we made just tons of games together. And, and I did art, <laughs> well, which we later got a, much better artist than Adrian, but you know, if you can't, uh, Roger Wagner on the Apple II said, if you can't draw, draw small. So that, that was my <laughs> clever technique for not going past 16 by 16. <laughs> well, it's a good thing resolutions were very small back then, either way, regardless of how you drew things. Yeah. Yeah. Now, was, with, was... with such tight deadlines, how were you able to stay creative and whip up a new game every couple of weeks? I mean, when you worked on these games, did you first come up with a story and then try to figure out the gameplay which would accommodate it? Or was it the other way around in which you first came up with an interesting gameplay mechanic and only then would you write a story to go along with it? Yeah, I mean, it, it comes up in various ways. So uh, it can come from any of those. It just happens like if you're... Th- what you got to have to do is I'll have a lot of creative input, which in gaming is mostly games, but it's movies and books. And you want all those ideas wheeling around because like something that's just in an article about science or something could like, oh, that could be a cool game mechanic, you know, or a word might come to you. That's how Anachronox, my RPG came to me. It was just, I was, well, in the bathroom and the word Anachronox popped into my head. It's like, what does that mean? And then I had to figure that out and, then, and go from there. But it's, you wind up having like a pad of paper or a tape recorder or something everywhere you are because, uh, and, and 
you don't want to miss those key ideas because you're not going to remember it in the morning. You're not going to remember it after you get out of the shower. I had like a shower tape recorder and at a time. And then later I got a, like a write in the rain pencil and paper. So you could, uh, I could come out of the shower and write down. Uh, just like if you fill your brain with things for your brain to connect, it's going to like give you stuff. And if you're just kind of let yourself be open to it, uh, uh, up here, uh, there is uh, Rick Rubin's new book, uh, The Creative Act, A Way of Being. And he describes the creative process really well and how important it is to give yourself a sense, like after you have sort of kernels of ideas called seeds, uh, give yourself time to like have timeless play with them and just kind of mess around with them and see where they lead. Because uh, if you don't do that, you're going to wind up, you know, like, forcing something through as opposed to, you know, like really following it to, to where it's trying to lead you. So I highly recommend that book. <laughs> and you highly recommend getting a waterproof tape recorder for your shower. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, anything just like get notepads and pencils or pens everywhere you are uh, and let yourself have those time. Like don't always take your phone into the restroom like have a pad in your car, like every every place that you can have sort of what I call drift time. Uh, so if you're in the shower, if you're driving, if you're in the bathroom, like those are times that your mind's just going to go blah, 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 and start. And, and uh, sort of hypnagogic time when you're going to sleep or when you're waking up, that's when all the rules come off your brain and it gets to wander and that's when it comes up with things. And so if you want to be creative, give yourself those times back. And get yourself a lot of input and, and stuff will just kind of happen. It's, and I think anybody can do it. And they said, oh, you're a creative person. Well, I just was uh, given a lot of creative input and had free time. That's, <laughs> that's mostly because like my parents had a game closet. So I had a, board games and Lincoln Logs and Ticker Toys and, and Legos. So I could just play, right? And, and those kind of like creative toys... Uh, we'll just sort of get your mind thinking in that kind of space. But since you had so many games, when did you have time to get bored and actually think of new concepts, new games? Well, it's 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 that you had a lot of that input, and then you just start up, you know, are playing, or you're and when you're a kid, you just have a lot of extra time. And so you're, you're just kind of like messing with stuff or like, I, you know, and your parents are happy. You're just drawing some pictures or something. So like, good, you're occupying yourself. And so like I would do that and I watch tons of TV and tons of movies and like all that is just kind of mushing around in my brain and, and, and having that kind of free playtime allows you to explore the combos of those things. I use Siri instead of using a notepad because most of my ideas come, like you said, in the shower or while driving or when I go out for a run. So I just ask Siri to write yeah. a reminder for whatever. Yeah, right. I, I have a, a note for ideas and I just type it. And just, I don't have to find a specific note. It's just one note for everything, what, whatever it is. And then I sort them out later. Yeah. Let's talk about Alfredo's stupendous surprise. What inspired the creation of this game? So there was already a series of Alfredo games, and basically they were charming. It was basically a little stick figure, and there were a lot of stick figure games later, but that was the first game one I ever saw. I guess Load Runner was also kind of a stick figure game. But anyway, so Alfredo just goes through these adventures, and you have binary choices, like do this or do that. One of those choices is going to kill Alfredo. <laughs> and so it's sort of like Mr. Bill or something with a choose your own adventure. So you just do that and he always dies in horrible ways. And then so there was a series of those. And then I was talking to Romero and just like, let's make the best Alfredo ever. Like, let's make an awesome one. And she's like, yeah, let's, you know. So so we I I designed the what happens and he coded sort of like a system where I could use sort of macro functions to encode like cinematic events kind of things. And we made this 
really involved pathway through all the different things that could happen to Alfredo in the story. And, and, and they're just absurd things that are happening, obviously. And, and, you know, but you have to memorize the pattern, sort of like Dragon's Lair. You have to get through the pattern to get to the end of the game. But you know, they're, they're, it was hilarious. And they're, they're, it was like for just a few pixels, they were quite violent. <laughs> basically uh and the so we we finished that game but it actually had occupied all of main memory and on apple twos it occupied the other bank of 64k memory so only 128k apples could run it and we finished it with eight bytes left so <laughs> there's there's literally nothing else we could do in the game beyond what we did. Uh, so that was pretty pretty impressive that we did that, and it's hilarious. Now, uh, as a surprise, a friend of mine in the Pico 8 community remade Alfredo's Stupendous Surprise. And since it was involved binary choices, uh, they did it like the the Black Mirror episode where you where there's that interactive choice, mm-hmm. uh, and so so they're like the timer is going down, dun, 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 uh, which was a brilliant kind of smashing together of two ideas, and they he got literally the whole game in there accurate to all all the content in there and and replicated all the graphics, and it was really fun. So if you look up. Alfredo's stupendous surprise Pico eight P I C O eight. Then you can you can play that right now. And could you elaborate on the creative process behind creating such bizarre situations, such as Alfredo's encounter with a giant talking <laughs> birthday cake? Yeah, I don't know. You just have to let your mind wander and like what comes into it, and and. Uh, some things, you know, you sort of like critique and throw away, obviously, and stuff like that. But sometimes it's fun just to like, what popped in my head? Big birthday cake. All right. <laughs> What's the big birthday cake mean? And and it just kind of like let it just kind of go from there. And just like it's it's a sort of a free spirited uh, sort of stream of consciousness game, I would say. And why did you decide to create a choose your own adventure type game and not just a standard arcade game in which you just pick up certain objects to progress the story. Oh, I mean, we were, we were doing all sorts of games, but Alfredo specifically are, are a very thin path choose your own adventure. It's like choose how not to die is more of what <laughs> there's, there's one wrong answer and one right answer. Like about, Eight times or something. You know, a year ago I played, I refound Shadow Knights and I replayed it. And then I remembered that I played the hell out of it back when I was a kid. Oh, so cool. On that game, you're credited as creative consultant and also credited for sound and level design. What yeah, can you tell I, us I, about I, that project? Yeah, I, I did uh, the, the levels, design the enemies uh adrian did all the art so that was the first i think that was the first time we all four worked together so it was technically the first it group game but uh uh yeah so but you know we we had all played you know various platform games like that and and so we we're kind of all had the same relevant you know comparable games to study and think about and so we just kind of riffed off that for our own, our own version of that, and in a way, it's probably uh, influenced somewhat by Karateka, the Jordan Mecker game that just got a re-release. Mm-hmm. It's a documentary slash game. Yeah, exactly. It was really cool of them to sort of preserve game history because, like, just like Martin Scorsese is trying to say, film history, like few people are like getting out there and saving games that are disappearing like like Romero and I did you know sort of Facebook and Google Plus games and they're gone now no one will ever play them and can't uh, because it's the nature of them it's kind of like sad that 
some of the gaming history is just, you know, gone just because their yeah. servers are not up or whatever. Some games from the early 2000s up until most of most of the Facebook games, for example, can no longer be preserved because you don't have the Facebook API to run them and you don't have the servers. And most of them were created in Flash, so you don't even have the plugin. And then if you run them locally, then nothing works. So, yeah, so there'd be a Herculean effort, you know, like, translate them to like you HTML5. Know, the, well, no, there's a you know, there's a animation like animate or something that that you can translate Flash to, but uh, but nonetheless, whatever it is, it's a Herculean effort to. Get those, even if the code bases survive, because you know code, those companies are gone. You know, so it's 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 in a way our medium is more fragile than film because you can still find, you know, the like it's still on, you know, it's bracketed cellulose. So like you can still play those uh, if you can find the projector or something. But ours are just like. Well, that company is not doing that anymore. Or that company doesn't exist anymore. So now those are all gone. So being a creative consultant on Shadow Knights is the equivalent of being an art director nowadays? No, I, I basically I was lead designer in that. <laughs> creative consultant was, hey, don't make them mad by work, have him working on a game here. <laughs> So it was just like I was consulting by working six hours a night on, <laughs> on the game. Yeah. And that same year, 1990, Catacomb was released. How did the Australian release, sponsored by Verbatim, alter the gameplay experience? And what specific in game changes were introduced to promote the Verbatim discs? Oh, man, that is such a deep cut. I don't remember that one. I remember the changes to Wolfenstein Super Nintendo, but uh, Catacomb, I, I don't I don't recall okay. if what or if we did anything to that, really. I don't remember. <laughs> it just, that, that could be considered the first person shooter. Wolfenstein probably is, but we had, we had started getting the idea for first person shooters because Romero talked to Paul Neurath, who was at Looking Glass, which changed the names later, but and he said they're doing this thing called texture mapping that kind of puts a graphics on the 3D walls. And Carmack kind of looked up and went, I can do that. And and then so we did we did Hover Tank, which was sort of just plain colored 3D walls and and sort of like a very blocky maze or sort of like old ultimate dungeons or something. And, uh, but, but that lets you have a tank moving freely through these 3d walls and had three sprites that you fired at. So it was possibly the first person. And then, um, uh, catacomb, we were shooting like magic out, you know, with a hand and then Wolfenstein, we, I, I designed the original like set of weapons and, the. Uh, the first levels of first person shooters ever, which is crazy and humbling to like, cause we were making Wolfenstein and we were testing it. And it was like, no one's made this before. Like, is that okay? You know, <laughs> it was kind of like weird, you know? And then, so like, you know, there's like, I don't know, 10 designers that have designed the first of something. And I got to do that, which was amazing. You know, but before we get to Wolfenstein, let me take you back to Commander Keen 1. Maroon oh, yeah, and, 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 and then 20 years later, right? No. <laughs> so how Mars. did you come up with the character of Billy Blaze and his alter ego, Commander Keen? All right, so uh, Karmic and I were there late at night, and he had just finished a smooth scrolling tile routine. So uh, it wasn't easy to move the screen around quickly because it's a whole lot of data for really slow computers. But he figured out a way to sort of use the EJ buffer against itself to kind of wrap it around. And, and then he uh, did a smart tile refresh so he didn't have to redraw all the things. Uh, and so it wound up, you know, making scrolling actually possible if it wasn't too dense. 
And and so he had a little dude, which was just uh, Romero's Dangerous Dave character, bouncing around on the screen in front of this. I was like, wow, that's really fast, you know. And then I looked over at the – we had a Nintendo Entertainment System in the corner playing Super Mario 3, and I looked over, and it's like, what if we did, like, the first level of Super Mario 3 tonight? You know, so he goes, yeah. So so he's sitting there coding. It's like, okay, Mark Tiles is one, and that means they're solid. Okay, and then I'm copying all the graphics in the original – first one one level and all the mario animations and stuff you know pausing the nes every couple seconds so i got the first level level of tiles and i got mario in there and i got a little coin animation and then i don't know if we had goombas at that time even but um but by 3 30 in the morning we had like a reasonable first level of, of super mario 1 1 and i made a little title screen because that was obviously rip off so it's a dangerous dave and copyright infringement and there's dangerous dave which is romero's character and there's like nintendo judge looking mad with a gavel on the other side of the screen and because it was you know we'd get sued if we published you know Mar- mario and so we'd put it uh on john desk with like a post-it note and i wrote play me or something like that and, and put it on there and then we, oh, we went home and crashed we got in late and also go into the office and then romero just grabs us pulls us in there closes the door and says i've been playing this all day oh my god we are so out of here and it's like what you know it was a joke <laughs> and but it was that they thought it was really good so uh like well you know like we should get this to nintendo it's like oh you know who knows nintendo but jay wilbur was also hired from uptime as well and so he knew somebody from nintendo so uh we made up that demo and sent it to nintendo and said oh my gosh you know like this is really cool tech can you like make a real super mario demo like you know the actual intro of the game world map and first level and so we did that over like two and a half weeks we just you know worked all day and night you know doing that and send it to them and they're like this is amazing and it got all the way up to the head table at nintendo and they said well, we don't want to enter the pc market that's like oh man that was that was our shot so i'm just like well you know uh, romero been getting this these pings from this weird guy in Dallas who ran this company called Apogee Software. Uh, and, and so he was like, well, maybe this guy would publish it. And then they said like, yeah, and said, I want to publish any of your games. So uh, they said like, well, time you come up with something. So I said like, I can come up with anything, you know, like, and Carmack goes like, oh, kid the saves the galaxy or something <laughs> or universe. And so I went up to my office in 15 minutes and wrote up Commander King, Defender, just, and, and the whole thing that you read in the first game. And I sort of just made up his universe in uh, 15 minutes. And there was references from George Carlin in there. And, and uh, uh, the bean with bacon is from one of his uh, stand routines. And, and it, I read it in a Walter Winchell voice that when I came back, like, Commander King, you know, like in the old news serials. And then after I finished... Uh, Carmike applauded, and then that was it. And then we just decided to to make this little outer space adventure. How did you come up with his wardrobe? Uh, well, Commander Keen uh, basically was me as a kid. Uh, like I didn't have a three hundred fourteen IQ, but I was called an egghead and stuff like that. And I grew up in Wisconsin, so. Green Bay Packer helmet, and you know, I purple was just because that was an EJ color that was kind of left over. <laughs> so we had that was something we could use, and because we used jeans and and uh, red t- uh, Converse shoes, like I had when I was a kid, and so like the only color left was purple. Uh, and then it was just I realized later though, you know, him having is sort of like he's a nerdy kid with a backyard clubhouse and. You know, he goes off and becomes a hero. But uh, I realized that I had been called an egghead and and sort of like didn't try to, as hard in school because I was getting picked on for being smart. So I didn't want to stick out, you know, and get picked on by other kids. 
But Commander Keen is like saying it's okay to be smart. You know, it's okay to see this guy's a hero and he uses intelligence to, you know, do great things. And so that's okay. And sort of healing my childhood in a game. I realized that like 20 years later. Yeah. You know, I wanted to dress as Commander Keen in our version of a Halloween over here. Heck but yeah. they don't <laughs> they don't sell football helmets over here. And I couldn't oh, find no. any red all stars. So I had the jeans and I had the the t-shirt and that's it. I was half the boy Commander Keen was. Yes. Well you could could wear like a, a yellow a yellow winter hat or something. <laughs> yellow bowl. What was your favorite level to design in the game? Um, I, uh, I think it was, I mean, for like the original trilogy, I really liked, uh, the combo on episode two where Vorticons would jump all the time to get up at you, but they won't jump in the dark. So you can turn the light switch off and control where the enemies go because they won't, they won't jump it. So you can trap them down below and turn the switch off and then get past where they would jump up and get you. And that was fun. And then also that uh, soda cans that you can collect for, you know, because he just collects sugar because he's a kid. Uh, <laughs> but the soda cans you can collect from the side or you can jump on them as platforms. So sometimes you don't want to collect them because you have to use them first and then collect them. So that those those kind of ideas were kind of like fun and clever and and led to interesting combos and stuff. And what was the most difficult level to design? Uh, most difficult level. Well, a lot of we were making them so fast in on Marooned on Mars that we just blasted out sort of just from our brain, like, this would be fun, you know, <laughs> that kind of just almost stream of consciousness game design. Uh, but uh, the concrete one was like killing the final boss because you had to do something way different in that. So spoiler for a game, very old now, but <laughs> but you had to sneak up to a, an, an upper area above the boss and shoot out a chain which then crashed a stone down on the boss. And so that was special programming. But probably the most complex thing was Mortar of Mortar McMire's uh, mangling machine. So you're the, basically the whole level is just a vertical level around this giant smashing robot. And you had to go and shoot key parts of it as it's you know, trying to attack you. And there's these sort of operatic enemies, you know, shooting sound waves at you, and then you have to shoot all the little sparks powering the mangling machine. So that, that was probably the most complex thing, because, you know, Carmack had to make the feet go up and down and the, the arms go down and like that. So it was it's kind of like live tile animation and collision with live tile animation and so on. Sort of our early, sh our early shadow of the Colossus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And why was a pogo chosen as Keen's weapon of choice for jumping high and not things yeah. like double jump or just making him jump higher in general? Well, we like the, uh, I, I don't know, it just came to me is that it should be something that a kid would have and it should be something that's unwieldy. Uh, so it shouldn't be easy to get somewhere. It should be something that if you get good at it and kind of control it, you can sort of get ear control and kind of do that. But it's really kind of like, oh, my gosh, you know, like kind of hard to control. And, and Karmic made that brilliantly to uh, sort of like make it a choice to do. But then, you know, it's hard to control. And then since we only had two and a half months to make three games, there's this one uh, lollipop that you can't collect. I think, well, I, I think somebody might have gotten it like, you know, a couple months ago or something like. But I think <laughs> I think you actually can't connect it. But I but I heard a rumor that somebody finally did it somehow. But but you have to like run and and pogo at the last second and try to collect it. And it's really. 
that's what you get when there's no QA and you're all just testing it yourself and blasting out 48 levels in two and a half months. <laughs> and pogo sticks was another thing I couldn't get over here. So I had to import one from the US for wow. my you Commander are King costume. <laughs> yes. For my Commander King half costume. Yes. <laughs> Commander K. <laughs> yeah. Commander Kent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're credited for your contribution to the game's sound design as well. Now, I'm sure that many people agree that every sound in this series is iconic. Can you yeah. share the process of how you conceived oh. and created these memorable sounds? Through extreme amounts of pain. <laughs> so basically, there was a very simple tool. Originally, Romero was kind of the tool guy. So he made Ted the level editor. And I think it was iMuse or something, which was a primitive sound tool where you literally just drew the sound wave mm -hmm. and it would play that. But it was very kind of chunky and lo fi. So anything sounding like a note, I just drew and kind of guessed what a note would be. There was like no lines telling you like, this is, you know, a good note or something. I just try to draw it and play it and like, ah, it sounds okay. And or, or change it a little bit. So uh, I'm really proud of getting that squish sound for poison slugs in Commander Keen. You know, like it sounded like that. And, and uh, sort of those, those are hand drawn guessed at notes. So if it's so, off, so it, these I, are I pixels, <laughs> these are pixels being played on the PC speaker. Yes. They're, they're basically like, here is just a, you know, X hertz to play for a second and then, and then play a series of those and it can approximate a sound wave. Yeah. And what you're saying is that it took a lot of trial and error to get it, to each and every sound. Yeah, it was, it was, I mean, apart from just typing in numbers, that was, the, that was like the most primitive tool you could use to make sounds for sure. And there's a sort of similar one in Pico 8, which I was all excited about. It's a little, a little even less, uh, less high fi <laughs> in a way. Yeah, but with Pico 8, it's, it's by choice. Back then, that, yeah. that was the tool that you was, had to work with. It was, it was this and nothing. <laughs> and then later, uh, Bobby Prince did like actual MIDI sound effects and so on. And what made you go with the shareware model for this game? Well, we signed up uh, with Apogee to make Commander Keen, and he had this thing called the Miller model, which is a basically it's sort of like here's Star Wars for free. If you like Star Wars, you know, please pay for Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, um, and because you know, took a, we did a lot of effort. You got a whole game to try it out if you like it, you know. Please get the other two. So getting one game free and getting or episode free and getting sort of two episodes seemed like a great deal. You know, it's like, wow, I'm getting a third of the whole game for free. And, and this is, you know, it obviously conveyed a way it conveyed to the to the player like, hey, this is go I'm going to get twice as much game of the experience I already had. So it was really a, a smart way to have try by implemented. I sent a check in the mail back in 1991, and I didn't get my game. Where is my, oh my game? God. Well, I believe you need to go on Twitter to Scott Miller and say, hey, send me the entire Apogee library, and he should send it to you. <laughs> and the source code. Oh, yeah. And well, I, the, I'm, getting, I'm getting the game with interest, and the interest is the source code. I see. I found four through six and got it to id, but they didn't release it, which is very unid like. And uh, if I ever find one through three, I'll release that because a lot of people want one through three because they can't mod it because of the compression algorithm. So. Now, I've recently become interested in discovering what game developers were listening to during the creation of, of these classic games. So what album was on repeat when you worked on the first trilogy of Commander Keen? Which is 
Uh, what is really funny is we agreed between um, like Carmike Romero and I when we were working on early games and later Adrian that we would each like put in a CD in a six CD changer or something like that or, or two CDs and that we would that way we'd all get to listen to some music we like but everyone would so it was kind of fair so Romero would put in like Great White and Dock In, you know, and sort of like a lot of the hair metal bands at the time. And Carmack uh, had like uh, Big Pigs Bonk and Zaza. Uh, and I had like Prince and Kate Bush or something like that, and uh, Peter Gabriel at the time. And uh, so we got to listen to each other's music and sort of acquire, you know, I, I bought you know, big pigs bonk and the, the, cause, uh, cause I heard it there. And, uh, and Carmack posted a few months ago that he, you know, attributed me to having a, a not trivial, uh, appreciation for Prince or something. <laughs> uh, cause I had like all his albums, but, uh, yeah. So we, we got to enjoy each other's music and sort of like, in a way, you know, get to know each other's, you know, tastes from that too. Now I want to share something with you. Dun, 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 page two dun, dun, of the dun. secret document. Now in the first Commander Keen trilogy, we also see a promotion for a game called Quake Fight for Justice. Yes. What was that all about? So I originally it was, we had some sprites that I think people found later. Uh, so Quake was just a um, character in Carmack's D&D world, sort of an old, gruff, tough, old fighter. Uh, and so we were going to have his character sort of like be the hero of this game. And uh, I think originally it was like a top-down sort of... There was a game on uh, the Apple II by Mangrove Earthshoe called The Bilestone. And it was a top-down, so you have an axe and... And, you know, top down, you have these kind of pixely but bloody fights on the battlefield. And we were sort of like thinking a, a game something like that because we were still, you know, in 2D world at this time. Uh, and that was a cool, you know, one word title. Uh, but that that never like making a game like that never happened. But in the end, really, Doom is what happened to Carmack's D&D world. Uh, which I can explain later. And then Quake was just around as a cool name. And so we thought of that as like, hey, let's, you know, that would be that would be a cool title sometime. And they eventually got to it. So this is a prime example of getting the story ready before actually working on the gameplay. Or getting the name ready. Yeah, it's more than more of the name, but but it's it's sort of an example of like keep a notebook around or or you know, keep I, if you if ideas get cut from somewhere, save them around, and they'll kind of pop up later as you know being useful somewhere else. So that's what happened. They literally that. pop up in Commander Keen one. Yep. <laughs> in April 1991, Hover Tank One was released. As the creative director on this game, how did you handle the transition to 3D? Um, well, I mean, we were all excited about 3D because uh, we played various primitive 3D games. Like one of my favorite early games in the Apple II is Woods of Degree 1 and through X, you know. But 1 through 3 were basically a simple line-drawn 3D hallway. And you go down there and then you encounter and then it puts a sprite that's on the screen. Like, here's your monster and you battle it with your party of six. Uh, and then there were other games like uh, Way Out, which is the 3D maze, and like the dungeons in Ultima were the sort of simple colored in one direction. They were like orange in one direction and blue in the other. Kind of. uh, and so our first game, we kind of did that with basically uh, the EGA colors. So we had essentially a palette of like eight blocks or actually seven blocks because there was, you know, like black. So 
Carmack would figured out how to do sort of 3D rendering of those walls. And we had cool sprites, you know, there were monsters in a maze and you were a tank and you were kind of trying to save humans and kill the monsters. And like, if you, a, but you could kill the humans accidentally. So ideally you're supposed to get 80% of the humans for the guy not to be mad at you. Uh, so he would give you the money, get excited, and otherwise be like, mm, you didn't, you kill all the people. Uh, and not get, you didn't get bonus cash for that. Um, but it was pretty fun, but I had to, like, as a designer, like, I was trying to make us something with a sense of space. So, like, you know, trees were a 10 by 10 green cube, and, you know, like, a cave was, you know, gray walls, square walls, and, and so just, like, I was trying to describe the spaces in my mind in this really primitive Lego world that you're kind of wandering through. Uh, but it was still made it fun. And, and that was like, I mean, it was mind blowing at the time to actually kind of smoothly go through a 3D maze. So that was fantastic. You know, I've always been astounded by the significant graphical advancements in the sequels released in 1991 compared to the original games from 1990. Commander Keen, Dangerous Dave and Catacomb are, are prime examples of that. What was it about the early 90s, in your opinion, that made game developers take these huge leaps year in and year out? Well, it was just the growth of technology. Like, you know, we all started with computers. I mean, I, I had sort of six colors, really eight colors, but six effective colors on the Apple II. And then PCs were then four colors. And then they grew to have 16 colors. And then they grew to have 256 colors. So every time there was like a leap, gaming tends to push the boundaries of what's released because anybody that purchased a new card is excited also about buying games that show off the new card. So that's usually who's going to buy games. It's not not the people that have sat with their computer for 10 years and aren't obviously as interested in keeping up with it and excited about it. It's people that are really excited about it and passionate that you that play games usually. Uh, and so we just sort of always kept you know pushing the frontiers because this to us was a new palette of technology we could use to make experiences. So I was like, we were excited to have more colors, you know, like EGA, wow, you know, we can actually have different colors and use one for shading or, you know, something like that. And then 256 was crazy, you know, it's like also just like 256 colors, well, now we need real artists because like 256 colors mean you can actually draw things and then obviously that's, that some programmer art is not going to suffice. So, but I mean, that's what enabled us was computers were getting faster and cards were getting better. And so we were on trying to be on the forefront of being able to do new things. And that's part of the reason we got to, you know, first person shooters first. And wasn't it considered risky back then? Because, you know, back then computers and computer parts were pretty expensive as opposed to nowadays. And so, Expecting your target audience to be the people with the high-end equipment might be risky in terms of getting your game out there. Yeah, for I the mean, masses. We, yeah, they're sort of like, do you make solitaire that everyone can play, or do you make the high-tech game that will make people want to buy a new computer? And so we were those people that were trying to buy the latest tech and they were excited about gaming. And we, so we made the games for us, hoping that others would, would love them. And since, you know, we had like this really, everybody was just really great at what they were doing. We had a shot to make something new, which happened twice, which was <laughs> literally amazing. Uh, and so, I mean, I think we we're just at the right place at the right time with the right people and all passionate about the same thing. You know, it's interesting because nowadays, most of the games that are being released support hardware that's five years old and six years old, you know, a graphics card from 2018 and 2017 without requiring people to upgrade. So that's an interesting shift. And yeah, it's a good thing I mean, you made that leap, but that always impressed me that back in the 90s, you know, you can actually review games from 1990 and 1991 and 1992 and see 
vast differences between them in terms of technology and, and frame rate right. and whatever, and even hardware with CD-ROM and such. But if you take a look at games from 2020 and 2021 and 2023, you can't actually spot the differences and state that's the year in which this was made. Right. It's it, There were like huge leaps in technology to it. Once there was actually you know, cards that could draw 3D graphics for you, then the the seismic shifts were just how many polygons can you do or can you add, you know, shaders or something like that. It's basically at a certain point, graphics are pretty good and they're, they're just getting incrementally better. You know, like, oh, you know, like there's ray traced lights, blah, 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 blah. But it's just somewhat better than like... I mean, you can see a difference between four color games and 256 color games. And that was like in a short period of time. And in that period of time now, it's just like, oh, my graphic card is slightly faster, you know. You're credited as the managing editor of the 1991 DOS version of Paragon. What was your contribution to this project? So uh, I saw it, I believe it was on the Commodore 64 disc. And um, I, we loved it. Uh, it was, I thought it was a really novel game mechanic because you're just kind of riding rails with this ball. And then you could leap off and it would go in a 45 degree direction depending on which way it was going. And it could land on another rail or bounce off walls and stuff. And in the, in the interim, it could pass over things. It could activate or, or collect or something. And so I thought that's a great, I've never seen that mechanic before that should exist as a real game. So we decided we kind of, as part of leaving soft disc, we kind of made 12 penance games. So they would have something to publish while they, you know, found new people to the camera's edge. So we were trying all sorts of different things. We did Mahjong. We did all sorts of different games, even, even like a small commander king episode, which I really didn't want to do for them. But, uh, but we needed to practice the tech anyway. Uh, but uh, so one of those things like, hey, Paragon is a great game. Let's make that for real, you know, and, and with nice graphics and so on. So it was kind of like a fun experiment. It was, you know, perhaps the our, our stunning you know, number one achievement. But it was it was a fun little game to just explore a cool mechanic and, and see what it see what it could do. On Rescue Rover also released in 1991, you're credited as the ingenious game designer. Now, we all know that you are an ingenious game designer, but how did you manage to get them to acknowledge it in the credits? Uh, I don't know who that might have been Romero type that, but uh, at the time, I, I, like, Rescue Rover just came out of my head whole, and and Carmack at the time said, I don't mind if he's listed first in the credits, because, like, you know, he just thought this whole thing up and did a little level design and all that stuff. So, um, but uh, that was like a super fun puzzle game to make. And, and I always wanted to make a puzzle game where you just have a bunch of different pieces and this sort of the stuff that kind of timelessly flowed out of me turned into really sensible combos of things. And it was fun to use them in various ways. Cause you know, like a robot that travels on right walls and electrifies any metal grating it's by that kind of thing. Uh, those were, those were fun things to make up and, and, and you could learn them and, you know, make interesting puzzles out of them. Uh, Romero and I made a game later called hyperspace delivery boy. That was kind of in that same, zone which is fun in 1991 commander keen keen dreams was also released now many people know keen dreams as keen seven while in fact it's keen three and a half yes what's the source of this misconception uh well just probably they found out about it (laughs) after they found uh, out that the first six existed and uh it's weird to number something as a half, but really technology wise, it's a king three and a half. We're just kind of trying to figure out the technology of a, what are called uh, tilted technology, tilted platforms or something like that, which was kind of 45 degree edges, which are a pain to enter. Oh my gosh, they're just like a very 
because like half of it's in the background and half of it's in the foreground and there's a pain to assemble. But uh, we needed to practice that and we needed to get a game out so it was easier to sort of make up uh, just a little quick episode of Keen while we were practicing it and then do it for real in 4 through 6. So it wound up being 3.5. So you gave South Disk a prototype for a game you want to release separately. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, basically, yeah. And I really did want to do Commander Keen because I like, I didn't want Keen to be somewhere that we didn't own. Uh, and yeah. And, and so he was. And, but weirdly, that's the only Keen that's re released is if somebody bought the rights to all the old softest games and got that. And where did the idea to create a game that takes place in Keen's dreams originate? Uh, that just in drift time, I thought it'd be inter- like it just seemed to be one to be interesting. I feel like this all happened in a dream, so you could do anything you want, you know, essentially. And so, when I was a kid, uh, one time I wouldn't eat my peas, and my mom made me sit there and at the table until I ate my peas, and I wouldn't eat them, and so I fell asleep at the table. And so that's sort of like the story that starts the game. So and then, so it literally started with me. Not wanting to eat peas, which are fine now, but uh, <laughs> but I didn't want to eat them then, and that's sort of all that sort of like that anxiety that kids have gets spun up into kind of nightmarish levels in this one. And, and why was the pogo removed from this episode as well? Didn't you want to give South Disk rights for the pogo? No, it was it was just like we added those sort of the flower power things you could throw, and we were kind of just exploring that and, and exploring like the fireman poles that you could slide down and climb up, and and so it, the verticality was handled by the poles. So like we thought, like well, maybe that's easier for this, and it wouldn't require a bunch of you know like as much testing about the wild pogo could go anywhere kind of thing, and and so we just left it off for that well in in dreams in dreams you tend to like not have everything you need to use in real life you know so it also kind of made sense as like you're just in this weird reality where now you have these things you throw and and you're in your bunny slippers (laughs) commander of king 4 the secret of the oracle was also released in 1991 and it features the catchy song eat your veggies by Bobby mm. Prince. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that was a great song by uh, Bobby Prince. And it, it was really fun to make up the dope fish. I mean, it's basically just a riff off of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy's Blood, Blood or Beast of Trawl. It's, that's the dumbest creature in the universe. And so the dope fish is the second dumbest creature in the universe. But it was... We are making underwater level, and I thought, man, I just need this big fish, you know, but you're going to get killed by a big fish, so it's got to be dumb. So you can fool it somehow. So, like, you can sort of lead little school fish behind you and kind of sort of, sort of drift turn and, and feed them to the dope fish, and, and then you can get through the level. So that was kind of a fun mechanic to sort of figure out how to get past someone that's dumb but hungry so, and wants to eat you all the time. But then when he manages to kill you, then you feel bad because he's dumb and you're supposed to be smart. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's why you got to figure it out with the, <laughs> with the school fish. But it's, apparently people just thought it was hilarious that a character would turn, look at you and burp. And so now it's like an Easter egg in a bunch of games. And, and there's a church of the dopey fish that some guy's a mm-hmm. priest of, you know, it's that's that's it's cool to have made the easter egg of the industry that's for sure now as far as i know eat your veggies was written for keen dreams but was removed from the game due to due to disk space issues why was keen dreams so limited in terms of disk space well soft disk like we have one side of a disk that has to fit with other stuff and and it has to work on five and a quarter and three and a half so it was like you know, basically limited in size, so couldn't like put everything there. And also, when we were picking, we we'd all kind of listen to the songs, and that kind of sounds like this level. And so we kind of like matched them with levels, so it didn't really fit any of the the current levels too. So this space and just sort of like personal choice made it perfect for later use and the well wishes. 
Now, one of the most amazing things that was ahead of its time in your games was Commander Keen's smartwatch. I used to love <laughs> looking at it so much. And in my Commander Keen half costume, I had a Casio watch with, you know, with a calculator. Perfect. It wasn't exactly the like Keen's smartwatch, but it was something. Yeah. Now I also I also loved playing Pal War on that watch. What prompted you to include this mini game in the main menu? Well, first off, the watch was inspired by both Dick Tracy and sort of the nature of what what would a smart kid want to do? Like he's traveling through space, like it's going to be boring for quite a few hours. He's going to want something to play. So I thought it'd be charming that he had this little, you know, controlling thing, you know, his sort of readout thing, but that he would like um, have something to play just to while away the hours. So just adding a simple pawn game in there was kind of fun. Dick Tracy with Warren Beatty came out like a year before that, and he had that watch in which he talked to. And yeah, I used to was, think it was, it was so cool. It was more based on the original comic, but it was mm -hmm. cool that it came out. But yeah, I already knew about the yeah, you know, the one from from the comic. But uh, if you notice, if you notice, the graphic is actually a scratched off Atari Lynx monitor because uh, we were making uh, the initial game for the Atari Lynx uh, a platform character called Pounce, but then I canceled. So, so when when I saw. Dick Tracy talking to his watch. It looks so cool back then, but nowadays if I see someone talking to his watch, it looks ridiculous. So I know. We got to that point technologically, but we shouldn't do it. But um the original in the comics, the original Dick Tracy watch has video phones. So it's not quite there, at least on the Apple Watches aren't. So they once they have a camera on Apple Watch, then it will feel you know Across the boundary of 1940s technology. <laughs> now we get to my favorite Commander Keen, which is Commander Keen 5, the Armageddon machine. Now, in that game, there are several green bottles of liquid that turn into a V when you collect them. What does the V stand for? Oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> I'll have to remember. Okay. Uh, so um basically the the bottles you collect are just a way to get a one up over time and it the juice is I forget what it's called it like sort of vivo or something like that, some kind of vitality juice. But that's the brand. So it's essentially you're collecting it and then they're holographically projecting the brand logo. That's, that's actually the logo of the company that uh, appears every time you collect one. Like they're trying to be clever and get their branding everywhere. And this this is also my favorite. Apart from the the robots and the futuristic look that it got, what I liked about this episode was the color palette. It was the most intriguing one, in my opinion. And so how did you come up with the color palette for this game in terms of the, the themes that are covered in this game? And can you share any interesting anecdotes from the development of this episode, given that we'll soon discuss the fact that it was the last game you produced in this trilogy? Yeah. So, I mean, Adrian was, you know, really uh, into like the, the depths of what you could do in EGA graphics. And he made the the best possible graphics up to date and are just, you know, stunning for EGA. And so, uh, we'd always like tried to make something, you know, sort of like fun and candy like, but the, just the nature of it being on a starship allowed us to sort of control certain things and, and like robots made it a lot easier to draw shapes and, and, and look, make something look cool. Uh, as, you know, rather than something really physical or organic or something, you could just make, you know, Robo Red looks amazing, you know, like I want that toy. Uh, so he went, I mean, I, I drew like kind of initial bad versions of them and then he, you know, made those drawings sing. So you can see the original Dope Fish and it's pretty funny looking, but then his version like looks really cool while keeping the character of the original idea. 
So same thing for Rover Red and a lot of the others. And do you know what the world record is for speedrunning Commander King 5? Oh, I have no idea. I've heard it, but this did not stick in my brain. It, it's two minutes and I think 30 seconds or two minutes and 20 seconds. That's crazy. That's literally crazy. Yeah, I mean, like, but, but you know, you make something and then people find, you know, like, little hacks and exploits and stuff like that. Like, you know, what Doom 2's first level is seven seconds. You know, come on. <laughs> it's like, this is, well, I can strafe run through this whole thing and then press the key. Not shoot anybody. And <laughs> it's just literally cool how, how people have, like, you know, found, played your game so much that they found such, like, clever ways to get past stuff. I see some of, like, the, I've watched some of the Mario and Zelda speed runs. And, you know, you're like, if I back through this, <laughs> this game or back through this one area, then I won't check because I haven't looked at the thing and then I can get in the hallway that I wasn't supposed to. And that's crazy, crazy what they're doing. So with Commander King 5, you just need to hang on the pole. And then when the, when the purple robot pushes you while you're on the pole, <laughs> it triggers some flag. And then when you exit the first level, then you skip ahead like 10 levels to a bonus level and then you get to the end of the game. That's hilarious. Yeah, well, I mean, th- yeah, we did put in certain certain, you know, cheats and stuff like that, but but it's like they're hacking how it's coded to enable those and that's just amazing. Like how many hours must have that have taken to find that? Oof. Your hats off to you, off my bolted. <laughs> Commander King 6, Aliens Ate My Babysitter, has always baffled me since it was produced before Commander King 5 and was not even released as shareware. When did you decide to change the order of the games? Well, it was supposed to be 6. It was supposed to be, you know, 4, 5, 6. It was going to just be the same trilogy concept. But then uh, Mark Green, who's now at uh, Epic sort of joined us as a president and he said, Oh, I can get this commercial deal if we do this one and then we'll just make a two game set for shareware, which winded up being not that great an idea because we lost sort of the trilogy encouragement uh that Scott's model uh worked for and and the uh, initial box for Keen was just not not a great box because they were just by us like a company that did business software. So Later we got a we had to go good commercial box, but it took a while. But uh, that's what kind of broke the trilogy into two parts. So it was kind of a, a two part you know, diptych of <laughs> games or something, and then like a commercial game, which is separate. And then the fact the continuity, given that you switched five and six. Uh, well, I mean, we we did the games when they had to be made. So it didn't really, really, it's not really about continuity. It's just about how can this small team of like four or some people get this out the door at the time six thing, get this out the door. And so we had a line in the sand for the commercial game, but the shareware game, we said, you know, co- coming soon. So like we, we had a little bit of extra time, like leeway there in the shareware version. So. That they just do what you gotta when you're a small team and trying to get everything done, too many things done at once. And what are your favorite Easter eggs and secrets in the Commander King series? Um, it's I've got probably the inchworms at the bottom of the, one of the pyramids in Commander King. So basically, you go to the bottom of this one pyramid and there's a bunch of inchworms. It's like, what are all these inchworms doing? But then there's bridges that are not like essentially extended so you can find the switches to extend those bridges and then if the instruments will follow you if you're on the bottom you know on their surface so they'll follow you so you can lead them sort of like the school fish you can lead them all together so when you get together there's 12 inch worms so 12 inches makes a foot so a foot literally appears like the mind python foot and you can ride that foot into a secret location that has like the alphabet and the uh, standard galactic alphabet, so you can translate all the messages in the game. So that was probably like that made the most sense. 
And once you got it, you know, and, and but it was the most mysterious, like, what are these things doing? And something you might not notice. So, like, all those things kind of combine to be cool. And also, like, uh, messy and uh, the little Nessie like creature going around the ocean and the original Commander Keens. And if you notice that, there's one place where you can jump on its back and then get to the same secret cave where there's a translation. Yeah, so th- those are those are fun, like just little things you notice, you know. And, and th- then then when people figure them out, they're so excited, you know. That's 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 a joy as a game creator. Yeah. So, what's your favorite King episode? Oh my gosh, I don't know. I mean, I love the gameplay in King Five, but I th- I I have a fondness for episode two, just because. Uh, I sort of figured out how to make shadows on the walls. The graphics look pretty cool. And mm-hmm. a lot of the ideas were really clever, like the turning light switch on and off and then platforms you could also collect. And, and so there are just a lot of like cool things that got done in there as far as, you know, like the first time I got to do, you know, think of those things and design them. And my mom, uh, before she passed, she was always playing Commander Team once for three all the time. And so, to me, oh, that is sort of, sort of, sort of a, I mean, she was 80 in her eighties and you know, she died at 91, but yeah, she was like old lady playing Commander Keen, which was, which is amazing. And she really liked it. It was like, you know, positive, charming, childlike game. So she really liked that. And she played them all the way through? Yeah. She kicked butt. <sighs> she, uh, yeah, she, wow. My mom, my mom was hardcore. <laughs> she, yeah, so you wouldn't so think that's where you got your genes from. I yeah, well, I, my my dad was a professional engineer, and my mom was a journalist and writer, and so I kind of got both sides of my brain. So my corpus callosum is awesome, but I don't think forwards as well. So <laughs> that's what I get for that. And did you ever get to play the 2001 Game Boy Color Commander King game? Yeah, I played it, and like the Dopefish secret is just sitting there on the wall in the first level, and it just the uh, it didn't have like a the charm of Commander Keen. It didn't have the progression of Commander. Keen. Like if it would have been a great game, I would have been great. You know, someone is you know found the love for it, but it seemed like it was like just kind of knocked out. Hey. On Dangerous Dave in the Haunted Mansion, which also came out in 1991, you're credited as the managing editor. What was your yeah. role in that project? I, I was lead designer. I was, I was just like weird. Yeah, both both John and I made levels, I think. Uh, but I came up with the the six shell shotgun mechanic, which was made the game, which is like you know, you're going through the the level and you're in the boss. And so you're trying to shoot the boss, but then you have to reload. So you have to balance because when you're reloading, you're still and the boss is shooting things at you and reaching out with hands. It's like, so it's very dangerous to pause and reload, but you have to. So you have to like time that. And so that was a, that was a good tension in uh, creating mechanic. And, and that was, that was a really fun game to make. Yeah. So, so the credits were basically a way of you guys switching things up every time you'd name the lead, yeah. de- lead developer and lead designer. Yeah, we were point. just like, yeah, we weren't too concerned about titles. We were all, you know, making the game together, and everybody had the ideas. Like, what if we did this? You know, and the the like the in the original Commander King, all Yorps have a little hop. Carmack just added that because he thought of it and thought it'd be cute. You know. And did you guys know that you were making history by having this as the first hit software game with a shotgun in it? Uh, well, no, it just, it just made sense. You know, like uh, uh, the original Dangerous Dave had, you know, a pistol or something like that. So shotgun felt more fun. And, and you know, we are all fans of uh, like Evil Dead and, and movies like that, you know, where and, you know, various action movies. So like we were kind of all, you know, had all the same input. So we were all thinking that that was a sort of a, it was also a, if you live in the South, like everybody's got a truck with a shotgun rack. And so it was like, you know, in our my you know, in our world. So it was natural to make dangerous Dave, that kind of character. And that dangerous Dave became Dave. Southern between the first and the second game. Yeah. And then that, that's, uh, that was Romero's character, so that was it. He he said, "Let's make him a redneck," and 
just didn't have a truck and all that. So we kind of just, you know, made a game out of where we were living, which made a lot of sense. Wolfenstein 3D came out in 1992. Yeah. Looking back on the development of Wolfenstein, what aspects or features of the game are you particularly proud of? And are there any elements you would have approached differently in hindsight? Um, well, I definitely know the latter. Uh, so so I, it was cool to, uh, like, I had made up the first sort of, like, goofy, fun mesh menu options, you know, like, uh, for Wolfenstein, which was fun, you know, for the difficulty levels. And then uh, just the, I mean, the cool, brutal nature of it was cool. and and. Uh, and in like the thing I'm most proud of making sure was in there was push walls because I had to fight for those because Carmack didn't want to do that because it's inefficient for his engine, but we, I needed to hide secrets somehow. And so the, those seemed that seemed like the most natural thing to stick in there. And once we got those in, then you know there wasn't just you know shoot shoot door shoot shoot door. You know it was there was something else to do, and that I'm a big believer in having that ten percent thing to do. Uh, otherwise you're, you're just getting repetitious and you're kind of boring. You need, you know, like some little hobby as opposed to your job. And in 1991, you were credited on more than 10 games. While in 1992, there is only Wolfenstein and Spear of Destiny. Was the production of both these games more time consuming than the previous releases? Or was it just because as a company, you put all your resources on the Wolfenstein series? Well, a, a yes, it was way more difficult to make this because we were making up new, new tools and new, new sort of new ways of doing things, and there was tons of levels to make that were a lot more difficult to make than the previous level. Plus, we were done making games for soft disk, so <laughs> that was that by its nature just kind of got those off our plates so we could focus really hardcore on, on the games we were making. And who was in charge of the German voices in the game? Sadly, it was me. So basically, I had a Merriam Webster dictionary, which I have somewhere. I think it's in storage right now. But uh, in the back of it, there were like little tiny dictionaries, translation dictionaries. So English, Spanish, you know, English, Italian, English, German. And so we had, you know, we were fighting Germans. Uh, that was Rara's brilliant idea because we were trying to come up with, you know, a, a subject where the enemies would really be evil. And so, you know, we were coming up with a whole bunch of things, but then he remembered Wolfenstein from back in our Apple II days. But um, so the enemies are Nazis and they spoke German. So here I am with this small, tiny dictionary of like words and phrases. So I just looked through all that dictionary for interjections, anything with an exclamation point at the end that someone would scream aloud. And so it got really kind of thin pickings as I got to the end of the dictionary, you know, there's not some that didn't make no sense in German. And then my sister took German in high school. So somehow I thought by osmosis, I could pronounce German. So I, I, I advised everyone on how to say their lines, which was very, very not, uh, an auteur's, uh, uh, it wasn't really a polyglot, let's show you. So uh, I, I just thought this is what it probably sounds like. And so there's horrible pronunciations. And the worst part is we needed a female voice for Griddle Grossa, which is the fifth episode in the Nocturnal Missions. And I did temp voices because we said, oh, we'll get Kevin Cloud's wife to do these. No problem. Got a female voice in there. Then we forgot about it because we were making so many levels and doing so many things at once. It wasn't on a list somewhere. So my bad pronunciations of German in a bad female voice are still in the game. So it's like, kind, dark guy, you know, like, really? Uh, <laughs> like, that, that, A, it doesn't sound like that, and B, that you don't sound like one. But in a way, it's kind of funny that, that you know, and, but still, it was horrible. And then also, we had hired an artist that didn't work out, and we had, he would, we had tasked him with, like, doing 
like flickering torches on the wall, but they weren't, the animations weren't aligned and it just wasn't working out. So we, we parted ways or something, but we had animated walls in the game and we forgot about them. So there's this engine to, that could do nice flickering torches or when animating TVs or something like that, totally forgot about it. And it wasn't used in the game at all in all six missions. So those are the things I regret. <laughs> And were there any worries back then regarding the potential banning of Wolfenstein in Germany? Uh, we didn't think about that until it got banned in Germany. And then we're just like, heck yeah, we did something that was like, you know, actually got someone's attention and that, that they didn't want in a whole country. So we put it in our ads after that, was like banned in Germany, you know, like, <laughs> we, we thought it was like, wow. And like, you know, I had, we had some kind of effect on the real world, you know, like that was, that was just you know, like in, bizarre. In Germany, in Germany, they can't even mention the names of the games. So here's an ad from a oh computer my gosh. game magazine. So yeah. Doom, Doom 2 and Rise of the... Mm. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. Also, like Rise of the Triad. The Triad was like I think it was that was Scott's name, Scott Miller's name. Like he, I guess both of us did not know about the Triads uh, across the sea. So, like <laughs> for some reason, there's this whole game calling them out and then not featuring them whatsoever. <laughs> so, yeah, well. but but yeah. So I mean, I understand that because we made Wolfenstein Super Nintendo. So. I, uh, I had we had to, Adrian had to make all the blood green. I had to change Hitler to stop Meister Meisterstadt and and uh, take out all the Nazi iconography. Which yeah, this is great that you know they're just making sure that specific thing doesn't happen. Again. That's cool, but I caused a lot of work on our part. Yeah. Now, from a level design point of view, what do you consider an optimal location for a secret room or an Easter egg in? first-person shooters? Well, uh, there's a lot of different ways to hide secrets, and they kind of apply to all things. But in 3D, usually you make the person think they've seen the whole room. Like, they understand, like, obviously there couldn't be anything hidden there. But if you actually go in and are carefully observing all the nooks and crannies, there's something in there. I, I made a it's funny like Romero and I have the same kind of like design sensibility about stuff. So I made a Minecraft uh, level or a world part of the world. It's a castle called Castle Conundrum, and I hid a uh, hundred signs in it, and I hid them in every single way you can hide something. So you have to be able to. Uh, see it, and if you if it requires it, you have to touch the sign. Uh, so there's one that require you know, acrobatic jumping to get up to. Uh, there's some, but the probably the best way to hide something is to hide a secret in a secret. So like you let them find the secret, but the real secret is hidden. Like after they've gotten that sense of accomplishment, there's something that they have to notice very carefully. Uh, in that area to find the second secret. And so you'll see that a lot uh, in all games, but in, especially in my games. So your MO is hiding a secret in plain sight and then hiding a secret within that location? Well, well uh, you can give us the first secret, you can have a little hint of it, or you can make it decently hard to find, or, you know, like, oh, you feel a little clever, but you have to get really clever to find the other one, so that's that's the fun part. And you got you can play you can play with both physicality and time and light, and there's all, there's lots of different ways you can sort of have the environment modify to uh, to hide your your secret things. And were you excited to see Sandra Bullock playing Wolfenstein 3D in her movie The Net? Yeah, that was that's trippy. It's like you see like a movie star playing your game, or like I just saw B.J. Blazkowicz on a big poster for a new Wolfenstein game, like under a bridge in a different country. It's like I just made this up in a room like thirty years ago. That you know, <laughs> and that that is a life of its own. You know, it's kind of wild. 
Now, in 1993, Tiles of the Dragon was released. Now, after yeah. such innovative and visually complex games, why did you opt to release a Mahjong-style game? We, we were just trying to get titles out to Gamer's Edge and try to, we were trying to do different styles, but we were at the end of the thing, we were so busy with the other games, we had to do something as simple as possible. It's like, well, Mahjong is pretty simple. And so we just kind of pumped that out while we were doing the much, much more uh, difficult 3D games and stuff. So you weren't asked to create more complex games that you were absolutely capable of doing? Just we, whatever we could, you could. We could up. do anything we wanted to do. We just had to have uh, a decent game on a disc. Okay. Yeah. In 1993, Hocus Pocus was also uh, released, and you're credited for a story on that game. What do you yeah. recall from the production of that game? So I, so I went over to uh, Apogee, and then they were kind of also doing the 3D Realms thing, and I came over to be a third-party, sort of a creative director over games, as well as uh, make rights to the triad. And so I would sort of like buy their games and sort of help them do what they needed. And Mocus Pocus was pretty solid. You know, I just made sure it was, it was going well and stuff like that. But like Duke Nukem 2 was really in uh, hard straights. So I had to like draw a bunch. I drew, I think I drew a font for it. I made up ideas for bosses. I, you know, like made up ideas for collectibles. I asked George, you know, what's the big thing about Duke Nukem? What's, what's his thing? And he says, well, he's really vain. I was like, well, then he's got to collect his own memorabilia. So then we put the memorabilia sprites in there as he's collecting, you know, magazines about himself and stuff like that. And that, that kind of really made it fun and sort of amped up his character. And I, I just did what games needed essentially like Duke Nukem 3D. They had a bunch of levels and they asked me to come up with a story after they made all the levels, which is like, okay, there's like, you know, pig cops and uh, aliens and there's like strippers like <laughs> and eggs, you know, like maybe they're you know trying to come to earth and impregnate women like alien, you know, like, <laughs> like, ah. I cobbled it together and like, yeah, that's great. And so there you go. I also came up with the idea for lasers, which they became trip bombs, essentially. And that's my favorite part of Duke Nukem Deathmatch is opening one of those little cabinets, putting in a trip bomb and closing it. Because like you open it thinking you're going to get a health pack. It's like, <laughs> that's, a, that's a great sort of emergent thing you can do in that Deathmatch. Now, are you excited for Doom's 30th anniversary, which is next month? Oh, yeah. Really stoked. I'm, uh, it's cool that John's doing like, more uh, Doom levels for it. And it's fantastic. And I almost made a Doom level. I'll see if I have time to make one. I mean, he's doing a uh, sort of selling a thing, but I, I may pop one out if I have time over the holidays. We'll see. But um, yeah, I'd love to do something like that eventually. Uh, but yeah, it's it's weird. I mean, like I've been making games professionally for 36 years. Like who gets to do that? I feel you know, very lucky and very lucky I'm still passionate about it because like the industry, you'll just grind you down, you know, and a lot of people left, you know, after a few games. I, I just like uh, hung out in Czech Republic with uh, Warren Robinette, who did the original adventure on Atari 2600. Uh, and it was really interesting to hear his stories of the you know, early Atari days and you know, the politics and stuff like that and all the like, horrible things he had to do to, to make that game work on such a primitive console and stuff. And it was really fascinating to talk to him. But he, I mean, he made a, a few games and then he just like, you know, I'm out, you know, like, uh, it's a hard industry. You know, th these past couple of years were pretty hard since 30 years ago is the 90s. Then right. every year since 2020, you'd celebrate the 30th anniversary of another game I played in the 90s. But I think this year was the most difficult one because tons of games came out in 1993 that I played. And so every couple of weeks, another game would celebrate its 30th oh, anniversary. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, there, there are just like certain key titles early on, and then like, then like everybody got in on the gaming thing for sure, and then then there's just like, oh, this, oh, that, oh, that, and well, you know. <laughs> but 
but it's it's yeah, it feels cool to celebrate it, and and it's been cool to like celebrate the anniversaries of each of the early Ed games and stuff. But then probably won't be as exciting until like you know forty or something like that. Uh, and then imagine being Doom being fifty years old. No, no. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna happen. Let's not think about it. And I'll wave my cane and go, yeah, we made this one day. And you guys are so used to your crazy holographic TV. <laughs> As the original creative director, what were your main inspirations for Doom? For Doom? Uh, yep. Well, we uh, all consumed the same, you know, genre movies and stuff like that. So the chainsaw is clearly from Evil Dead 2. I mean, that's obvious. And so we, we just had so much time watching those together and thought it was hilarious, you know, and so we sort of have the chainsaw and uh, he's got the, you know, he's got his boomstick and he's, you know, like uh, all, all those kind of things are, are just like fantastic fun. Uh, and then we sort of evolved, you know, the weapons from Wolfenstein a bit, you know, but kind of kept the same flavor of that. And then uh, one one day, I think we were in Taiwanese Tower, and Carmack said, like, you know, I can draw one big sprite on the screen for a l short time. Like, we should just, like, have, you know, like, the big fucking gun 2704 or something like that. It's like, yeah, that sounds awesome. So we found a toy at the local toy store that was kind of technological zapper or something like that. And then we sort of scanned it and flipped it. So it kind of made a big wide sprite. And then we kind of rose that up there quickly and blast something. So that was like, that was just that BFG was totally just Carmex realizing you could do that really quickly. And that's where that came from. And what was your original vision for player engagement and rewards during the development process? Uh, well, I had a slightly different vision, uh, than the sort of simpler one that happened because Carmack just wanted his tech out. And so he wanted levels that worked fast in there and was kind of poo pooing anything. So I just wanted a, like a little establishing screens. So it's sort of like aliens, right? So at the start of aliens, roughly, uh, he shows you a monitor with all the sort of inhabitants, transponders or whatever are all in one place over there. And you know there are like bad things around. It's like, oh my God, what is what horrible thing is over there? So as you walk toward that place, yeah, you know, things are jumping out and scary and stuff, but you have a sense of dread, like, oh no, something is, you know, at the end that's going to be horrible. And that's sort of what I wanted to create in Doom was that you don't have to have tons of story, but you you just give them a inkling of story that gives you a sense of dread. So you, as you're going forward, you're like, Oh my gosh, what am I heading toward? You know? So you literally have a sense of doom as you walk through. Uh, and, but, uh, that we just disagreed on that. And, and I wanted to have environment dangers in the levels, which were simple, but that was got shot down. He just kept wanting simpler and simpler and simpler. And he even gave me a book of like army buildings that were just like, rectangular cement buildings that like no one's gonna love walking around these these are boring squares you know like i really wanted a sense of place so in between there it was just like and him kind of hovering and seeing less polygons i just kind of like it kind of like stopped me from being creative and where i had that timeless play before that wasn't that anymore and so that that made it difficult to work together so where I had some sense of that on the next game on Quake, uh, you know, it's just like, here's these cool keys for the hellish version. Nope. Not going to put those alternate keys in. Well, okay. <laughs> you know, like, just kind of like frustrating, like just small things, you know, you just want to have flavor, you know, but. So, so your original is. vision focused on the atmosphere more than the action? No, it was, it was just spending a small time either at the start of the game or just sprinkled in giving you a sense of dread or purpose and both games would have been great and it doesn't yeah, i mean i i love the raw unknown cool of, of the doom as it is i would have loved you know like sort of setting up my idea was to since you can play it co-op or, or the idea was we we're going to play a co-op uh that 
you're just starting with a card game and a demon bursts in the room and kills how many ever players you don't have. So if you have two players, two people are killed. If you have three players, one person's killed, you know, or three people are, there's a bodies on the floor since we already have the bodies sprites. And so it was just a way to start a co-op game uh, as it was intended at the time. Uh, and that, that was kind of a, a cool, simple idea. Just, you know, one, one, thing on there and and i wanted more kind of realism because adrian started drawing really realistic textures that were i mean not all the way realistic but like a lot more realistic than some of the the scan pencil ones and it was i was like really excited about that and the, the way the light shone across them was really cool you know it was like it was like really you know sort of a leap up but uh and in the end we just sort of agreed to disagree in part of ways but but I think they would would have both been cool, and 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 I I stand by liking that the player could have a sense of dread as they go, and it's it's more than just monster closets. Eventually, they created a similar concept in Alien Isolation. Have you played that game? Yeah, that, I mean that's terrifying, and then we almost did the an Aliens game, uh, but Doom was almost Aliens. Uh, because Paramount pitched us and said, Hey, you know, we want to do a game based on aliens. Like it almost happened. And then they said like, nah, we want to do our own RP. And, and so we did, but, but that was almost it. Now let's talk about WAD file format. How did you come up with this file extension? Well, uh, we were just working. I was up, we sort of got an apartment, uh, a separate apartment to be our office. And so we would have, go from our apartment, walk around the pool to the office and work. So uh, Marer and I are upstairs and Carmack was downstairs and he was coding, blah, blah, blah. And then he just, we had originally for Granikeen, we had lumps. And so we had a bunch of lumps that were, you know, grabbed from uh, as graphic files or sounds or something like that, just like they're lumps of data. and. Karmic was making one big file format to put all the lumps together. And he says, like, what's a good extension for a bunch of lumps? And it, uh, I just thought for a second, just go, wad? <laughs> it's, you know, like, and so that that's how the wad file format got. And he goes, like, yeah, that's great. And then I later, I retconned the definition of wad to be where's all the data. But it was just, a, what's a bunch of lumps? I love the fact that you keep on proving that every iconic thing about the games you've worked on just came off the top of your head. Yeah, I mean, it, well, it it is like that, but also <laughs> you have to fill yourself with so many creative inputs that creative outputs become easy. So, like, you have to constantly be devouring other games and movies and books and articles and anything you can to fill yourself to the brim with, like, the world's ideas. And then connecting those is easy. Like Steve Jobs said, creative creativity is just connecting things, which it is. It's just like, you know, sail. I have a, like a skateboard. Put them together. Oh, you know, like, like there's a new thing, the sail on the skateboard. You know, it's just connecting two things. It's like, hey, that'd be cool, that kind of thing. So, like, I mean, Prince is like, you, know, you really love James Brown. You really love Jimi Hendrix. Well, let's play, let's play Prince, you know. <laughs> that's, that's what I think of those two guys. Now, I know that you have the chainsaw that was used as reference in Doom. Have you used it since? Oh, the chainsaw that was used in Doom? One moment. Yeah. <laughs> Is it working? Oh, my gosh. Oh. Right on it's the webcam. <laughs> yeah. Da, 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 yeah. John, John and I signed it so far. I got to get the other guys. But uh, yeah, here it is. I have not used it since, and I kept it nasty and dirty like it was in the day because mm -hmm. it feels like it's more of a prop that way. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Kind of more real. I have not lit this up, though. It's probably gummy and crappy inside, so probably I don't care. Yeah, but, but I, I like have 
sort of knighted game development graduates <laughs> at when Romero and Brenda taught at uh, UCSC and I've you know taken it to certain places where people get pictures of it which is pretty fun probably donated to the strong museum of play or something one day or sell it on eBay yeah I could get a pretty penny probably but uh, we'll see now, what are your thoughts on the various sequels and spin-offs to Doom? Did any of them come close to your original vision? Um, I, I really liked, I mean, the full sort of experience of Doom and Doom 2 did tell my original story, which was you're in, you know, essentially on this terrestrial, you know, normal, normal space. You go into hell. And then on the, eventually you return and sort of your normal reality has been perverted by hell. And then that, so basically they did tell kind of the original story in those both and with all the places I had sort of come up with. But, um, but after Doom 2, I think Doom 2 perfected the Doom feel, you know, the, the super shotgun and stuff. And then... Uh, Doom 3, to me, like, I was really excited because they had physics. It's like, oh, they're going to do all the physics. And I had, you know, rolly chairs that you could push in the way of to set off laser traps and stuff like that. And they had rolly chairs. And like, oh, my gosh. And then they did nothing with them at all. It was just like, well, we have physics. Here's a tech demo, which was disappointing. So it was just kind of monster closets. I kind of, like, put on God mode and to get through it. I did, like, Super Turkey Puncher, which is fantastic. Uh, but not until Doom 2016 did I feel like all three things were there. Because to me, uh, Doom is scary, dark, and fast. Because we were the, the first game to go full dark at certain points, which is scary. You know, like, I I have no information. Where's the light? <laughs> that kind of thing. And so Doom 2016, I feel like, get let's play Get Dark. Uh, it's scary and it's fast. Doom Doom 3 wasn't fast. I mean, it was cool looking. You no, know, get it twisted. It, was, it looked really sharp, but it was slow and 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 spooky, but not not fast. So I think Doom twenty sixteen is like, oh yeah, I'm, they're making me move, and like I'm having to, I'm in a, I'm in constant movement panic, and then that that was you know that was like really cool, and it felt 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 like Doom was back. You love the fatality move where you can take a, a monster up close and kick it in its face or whatever. Well, I mean, we were always about, like, even in uh, The Dangerous Day uh, or or whatever, we, we would zoom in, you know, to the horrible death. Uh, so even then we were doing kind of primitive uh, versions of horrible death. So, and, you know, like... That it's a sort of a riff on Mortal Kombat's kind of zoom in and stuff like that. It's fine, you know. It, it, it you know it, it makes it raw and physical, which is which is fun. But to me, it's it's the keeping you constantly moving is the cool part. On the 1994 SNES version of Wolfenstein 3D, you're credited for levels and tallies. What tallies are they referring to? Well. Uh, that's like the I think the last thing I coded it in. I coded the bonus screen on the Super Nintendo. So basically it showed all the numbers, you know, on your part time. And then if you beat the part time, I had little stars bounce around the screen. That's the tallies? Yep. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Also in nineteen ninety four, Rise of the Triad Dark War was released. What has this game allowed you to do that you couldn't in previous FPS games? Um, that game was a. Although there's a level left behind that had the first rocket jumping uh, in Doom, it wasn't like a big feature because you could only kind of rocket jump sideways in a way. But uh, the. Uh, uh, Rise of Triad used rocket jumping as a mechanic. Like you had to do it to solve some stuff. And uh, it was the first game since it had verticality and we were solving the same problems that Quake was solving. Uh, I came up with jump pads. So that was later used in Quake 3 to like, boom, you know, get you vertical very quickly and in an efficient way. Also, it did have crazy anime like 
uh, weapons, and that was due to uh, William Scarbo, who's a big anime fan, and so he's like, oh, let's do all these crazy drunk missiles and <laughs> that kind of stuff. And that, that was my next question. This game embraced unconventional mechanics for its time. Could you elaborate on the design philosophy behind implementing features like multiple playable characters, an arsenal of diverse weapons, and the ludicrous Gibbs system? Yeah, the the actual different characters were uh, sort of the concept I was hoping to start Doom with. Is that you know these are the people around the table playing cards, and it was just sort of a sort of more personality to having four player than than others, and you could tell people apart. Uh, and then um, uh, the weapons I was trying to make, like what can own the floors? That's the flame wall, you know. What can you know own the sky? And, and, and so I was trying to like figure all the different things out. And then when we were doing a digitized technology that was like kind of more realistic uh and we initially had like feet anchoring because it was kind of like made you sort of feel like the things were actually walking the ground we later took that back because people aren't that jazzed with it but um when it was like too busy for wolfenstein part two we essentially had a whole bunch of work done with like digitized you know uniforms and weapons and just like oh boy you know like either we can like throw this all out or embrace it and so i said let's embrace it i was like okay let's just have fun with this this is just like going to be like a an obstacle course roller coaster kind of a game uh and we had you know had god mode and and we sort of invented that in the id games. I thought like, well, opposite of that is dog mode. What if we made a literal god mode and then made a dog mode that's just opposite of that? And so you get to be a big, tall god throwing, you know, like energy bolts and destroying people. And then you get to be a little dog whose barks can explode people. And it just sort of added like whimsical humor to a thing. Might as well have fun with it. If you're, if everything is crazy around you, why not, you know, amp up the crazy Looking back, what aspects of Rise of the Tribe do you believe were most misunderstood or underappreciated at the time of its release? Uh, I think it was like one of the most inventive as far as uh, deathmatch, we call it combat, but it's basically all the parameters you could use in deathmatch, like one shot Charlie and like changing gravity and all sorts of things made it have a lot of different ways you could play deathmatch and having 11 players just made a lot more chaotic and and it it was there's a lot of innovations in that uh aspect and the other part of it is i I mean i don't think it was misunderstood i think i think it was trying a little too hard to be a 3d game so it kind of like uh, limited itself in, in how, the way it could graphically represent like what you're walking on and, and just because the engine limitations and stuff. Uh, so it didn't look, that part of it didn't look as good as I thought it could, but we we're kind of like on the road already. But as far as like deathmatch and jump pads and just crazy uh, weapons, I think it did a lot of things right and it, it was... It was, you know, interesting to be able to, you know, see different characters and, and have multiplayer that kind of made you feel like you were, were different players rather than just, you know, on green and you're blue, you know. In 1995, my favorite flight sim was released, Terminal Velocity, on which you're credited as co-producer. What can yeah, you tell us about I, that I, game? Yeah, I was third-party creative director on that. Uh, I actually did the font for it and the story. And the deathmatch, I uh, designed the deathmatch levels for that. And uh, it was, they had the good sort of like FOV kind of feeling of speed, which was great. And uh, it was, it was turning out pretty cool. And, and uh, since Carmack, since they changed the BFG 9000 or 2 9000 from 2704, I used 2704 as the year uh, <laughs> for that, for that game. Uh, just a little tidbit. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it turned out pretty well, but the, the shocking thing was we made that whole game together 
And it came out and we we're going to E3 to see, you know, it be at our booth. And then at the same time, over at the Microsoft booth, there is a game called Fury Cubed, which is the exact same game, <laughs> including my font that I drew. <laughs> and and it was just like, it was like, well, we had to survive. It's like, you could have told us that, you know, we're essentially making the exact same game and releasing it at exactly the same time. Uh, I mean, it was just, that was just shocking. So it was, that was very uncool of them to do, but that's what happened. And I, I love Terminal Velocity as a game, but that was, yeah, that was just a weird, a weird, weird, weird thing to, to have happen as a dev. I've never experienced that again. It's just like, you know, that's shocking. I still prefer Terminal Velocity to Microsoft's clone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not Microsoft's fault at all. It's just, you know, they sold it to both of us at the same time. And, you know, if back in 1992 you made me upgrade to VGA because of Commander Keen, then in 1995 I had to buy a joystick to play Terminal Velocity. There you go. Well, everybody, little or big, you're, everyone's upgrading their technology to do the latest thing. Yeah, so and that's all for it. You know? okay. It's mainly, it's mainly due VR. to your games, at least in, in my life story. Well, I, I just got VR and AR technology to play all those cool games. So, And I was in it for three years. So that was fascinating. I was actually did one of the first VR games in Wolfenstein VR in 1992 or three. Yeah. I mean, it was really primitive, a little helmet you put on and then you control it with a joystick and it was really fuzzy, like two Game Boy advances on your head. But, but it was, it was interesting. You could see where the technology was going to go when everything got higher res and, and stuff. So it was fun to sort of revisit that later when it actually is fun to play. So, Back then, I played LucasArts Dark Forces in VR. I had to, uh, I was able to experience that game in VR. And back then, when you tr used VR to test out the technology or to see if it's a good fit for, for your games, did you think that it would have a future in the 90s? Or did you feel that the, the release of VR was premature at the time? Well, I... Yeah, I didn't. I don't think the experience was stellar, but it, I, it was obviously a stepping stone to a future where it'd be cool, and it was worth a, a step worth taking, even if that step was not you know this big groundbreaking fan and it wasn't going to be blow up right now. It that's a step that needed to be t taken so that we could get where we are today. So this is more for the good of the industry. <laughs> In 1996, you got special thanks on Duke Nukem 3D. What was your contribution to the game? Yeah, like I said, I, I came up with a story for that uh, and the turbine, uh laser idea. But uh, probably the biggest thing was I made sure it didn't suck. So we were, they were making Duke and, and we were working on Extreme Browser Prize or something, but they were working on Duke and like everybody was quitting exactly at five o'clock and playing Doom. And eventually I just kept seeing this and I eventually I just dragged George in a room and said, this game is turning out bad. Like everybody is stopping working on what should be a very, very cool, better than Doom game and playing Doom. There's a reason for it, and you need to fix it. And so he got rid of the guy that was heading up what they released as Lame Duke later, and he just took it over and made it big and funny and fun and, and crazy, and that made Duke what it needed to be. And so just that conversation with George changed his direction from being a crappy game to being something that, you know, people remember fondly and, and board winning and all that. They should have given you the credit of made Duke not suck. Yeah, that, that was S accurate. Special but... thanks doesn't cover it. <laughs> yeah. In 1996, you also worked on the Prey engine. What was your part in its production? So I came up with the original 
So first off, I just went through the entire dictionary trying to find cool words. Because like I thought like there must be like some cool words that people haven't named game jet. And one of the coolest ones was prey. I was like, oh, that's a really cool name of something. And there wasn't even a movie named that. And it was like, wow, you know. So, uh, so I came up with the idea sort of like running man's where you're like the prey of, of an alien civilization and you have to perform in these arenas and you're you know, like, there's agility arenas and strength arenas and all that stuff. And it was going to be really cool. And you had sort of like a tech suit, uh, and it was really cool, but, uh, sort of disagreed with George on, on that direction. And so like I would, at that time we were waiting for the engine to come about. And it was taking forever. Like, uh, I mean, it was going to be cool portal technology, but it was taking forever. And so I started talking with Romero and he was like disenchanted working on Quake. And he was, you know, I'll get it out the door. But like, what if, what if we were at a place where you could design anything you want? And I said, well, that's like a dream. Uh, and so we, we planned, I planned to leave and then, uh, he had been talking to uh, the other developers on Rise of Triad or, and then Prey and saying they were disenchanted, you know, with the direction or something. And so they were going to leave and start their own company. And so a uh, hilarious conversation. They came over and said, hey, we got to tell you we're, we're leaving, you know, and so like that. And it's like, well, that's too bad because I'm leaving too. <laughs> and so... So then we, we actually announced it on the same day to George, which he was upset about, of course, but you know, like it was just, you know, once, you know, the engine's taking forever and, and on their part, you know, that was frustrating. And then, uh, the sort of disagreeing on the way price should go was, uh, on my part. And so basically I had my design, which I liked, which some of which kind of wound up being an anachronist as sort of lightly conceptually. But, um, then another guy took over prey and then another, then they finally got a, a third designer was the Goldilocks designer to get what prey was actually out. I didn't, I didn't like the, uh, native American choice, not that a great native American game would not be fantastic i just thought like a bunch of white guys appropriating native american culture for for a cool theme uh wasn't unless it was done really right i was not comfortable with that because i am because my brother actually got into um sort of native american culture and like i knew more about it than than the people that are making it essentially and i'm just like well you don't want to this is really offensive. I think, you know, like calling him a brave or, you know, like that's, that's really kind of tacky. So, uh, I, yeah, I wasn't happy with that. So we all kind of like, and, and went on to make our, our dream games out. Well, in 2000, you decided to give voice acting another try after rise of the triad. And you did a little voice acting in Deus Ex. How'd you find yeah, I, that experience? That, well, that was fantastic and uh, shocking at the same time because um, I had done acting and improv in college. So, like, I, I was comfortable doing other voices. You know, I did Palatine and Acronox and so on. And they had the part of Walton Simons, you know, the sort of, like, genetically modified dude and stuff. And uh, I had just seen a TV show called Murder One. And the, in that, the detective is a really ridiculously low voice. It sounds comically low. But I thought, like, for an evil guy in a video game, oh, that, sound, that might sound cool. So I did my version of that. And so they gave me the script. Like, just literally hand me the script. And I'm like, okay. And they said, well, just, you know, do do a practice take. And then I, so I said, you know, have they been infected? You know, and I read the whole intro. And then I said, okay, well, that's good cold reading. Let's, uh, let's do the real one. And they go, no, that's it. We got to go. You know, we have thousands of lines to record. And like, what? I, <laughs> I want to do a better reading, but people liked it. They thought it was so sort of calculating and cold and, and uh, dispassionate that, that it kind of worked with the voice. And so that was fun. It was fun doing the screams and all like that. But it was weird because I later played the game. And then I got to a part in the game where I had to sneak past myself 
which is where <laughs> it's a weird feeling. I'm like, there I am. All right. I, and they're not, I'm here myself talking as I'm sneaking back. <laughs> this is the second story of yours in which you used Scratch VO in the final game. Yeah. At, at the first one. Yeah. I guess the first one was Wolfenstein. Yeah. I know. It's just, I, now that you point that out. Maybe it's a problem I have. I need to it's a better scratch what scratch voice anonymous. Uh, but yeah, the first one was just like overworked. The second one was not of my choice. So I at least I, I learned that that was <laughs> that was not a thing to do. You were in both stories, so you're to blame. Yeah, so okay. And then I also did the voice in the intro of the second Deus Ex or something, but Anyway, just running into a helicopter or something. I almost did it in the third one, but uh, we couldn't get schedules to align. You were the, the project director in the second one, right? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> I don't know. I was just with this female actress, and I were, we were running hurriedly into a helicopter or something. I don't know. <laughs> That's about all I remember. In 2001... An Equinox was released. What was the inspiration behind An Equinox? Uh, An Equinox was sort of, well, that came to me, as I said, in the bathroom. Just that word. I thought like, well, and other things that had come to me, but An Equinox, I was going to make a sci-fi RPG. I knew that. What does that mean, though? It's just like, well, it's sort of like anachronism, which is something out of its proper time. And Nox, which could be noxious you know like something poisonous so i sort of thought well that could mean poison from the past so what does that mean and so uh, poison from the past the all the characters have something horrible that happened in their past that they need to heal as part of their character arc or the whole game but also in the big story there are evil, chaotic aliens in the previous universe that are dumping dark matter into our universe, trying to make it collapse so and stay collapsed so the next universe where their enemies are are never never exist. So it's sort of like, you know, big, huge sci-fi, you know, big bang collapse story about poison from the past. And the characters all have their smaller arcs of poison from the past that they that and all of that needs to get healed in the arc of the game. So it's kind of nice to have those two mirror each other. And how did you come up with the the game's unique blend of of science fiction, film noir, humor? Well, it sort of combined a whole bunch of things. So obviously, there's all it's wearing fandom of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and the Slate. There's a lot of lampooning corporations and sci-fi concepts and, and, and RPG tropes and stuff like that. And then Sly Boots, who's the main protagonist, Sylvester Bocelli. Sly Boots was a detective character I made up in, in college in little short stories. And he was just a 40s detective. And he was based on the Fire Sign Theater, Fire Sign Theater's Nick Danger. And those are funny radio plays. So uh, if you, if, I think it's the Further Adventures of Nick Danger uh, is hilarious and, and, and joke a minute. So if the people like, you know, the airplane kind of movies and stuff like that. This is like uh, a quirky joke a minute radio play kind of like that. Uh, and then he's a hardball detective, you know, it's like Sam Spade, but he's kind of clueless and stuff like that. And I love that kind of like feel of like, a guy who thinks he's, you know, so great, but he's actually dumb. And, and, and from that and Sly Boots, you know, Nick Dangerous Sly Boots, Star-Lord's kind of that kind of character too. So uh, it's kind of neat to see that kind of uh, vibe live again. But anyway, uh, so that's where that came from. And then I was a big fan of Chrono Trigger. And so that is the sort of the substance of the RPG of the thing is like, what if you did, did a Western take on sort of the classic JRPG feel and, you know, you already have three characters at once and, and you could choose who goes with you and the game's different by doing that. Cause I loved how they had like 
you know, different places you could go depending on who's with you and 13 different endings and, and that kind of stuff. So it was just rife for that. And it was also lampooning stuff in general because I, you know, I have sort of that a satire sense of humor where, you know, satirical kind of stuff comes out. Like, you know, you, they collect things, but they're called tacos, which is totally arbitrary collectible objects, you know, and they're just golden tacos spinning on a stand that people collect it for no reason. It's sort of like the pet rock fad, you know, like that kind of thing. So I, I love those kind of like ways you can play with stuff. And I'm really proud of all the different kinds of, interactive gameplay we got in there and, and uh, just sort of like the really epic story we were able to tell. Was Blade Runner also an inspiration? Oh, yeah. I mean, every single genre movie, everything uh, we could, you know, it's sort of like the that sort of like city feel down the street is definitely from Blade Runner. Yeah, it's like you know, with the kind of blue neon and all that. Very much so, yeah. And how big was the original scope of the project and how much made it into the final game? Well, at, at a certain point uh, into the game, we realized, like, Jake and Richie came to me and they're just like, all right, you know, we got to get this thing done and there's this much of the game left and uh, we got to, we probably got to cut like a third, maybe half. And, and when they said that, just like, well, we have to cut it there, obviously. That's the only place you can cut it uh, and stop. Uh, so we sort of cut it about 60% in. And so that left everybody on this gigantic cliffhanger, which was a surprise before the real ending or something. And so I had loved to finish the, the story of Anachronox. I'll get it out somehow. I'll, I'll write it down and leave it in my will if I have to, but <laughs> I'd love to... Get it out in some format, whichever way that is. But um, I think it still tells quite an epic story and 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 has a lot of variety and interest and makes fun of everything from science to comic books to uh, corporations to like RPG tropes. It's it's pretty wide ranging and, and uh, it's uh, a a game that will really make me laugh. And, and by the end, can make me tear up. So the cliffhanger was not supposed to be the real ending. It was something that was supposed to be halfway through the game with a conclusion yeah. that you see in the real so ending. No, yeah, you know, like a, in a mystery, you know, you'll have like the big reversal, like, oh, no. And then then you have to solve the problem after that. Mm hmm. That's that was the idea is that you solve the problem after that, and I know what happens. It's just there was it was sort of like we would have to do assets for a whole another universe to end the story. What I love about the Necronox is the fact that back then the UI for the point and click adventure game elements was far superior to the one that LucasArts used. Since back then LucasArts 3D adventure games were keyboard based. And yeah. the fact that you had a mouse cursor that could move in 3D space in Into, addition to yeah. the 3D keyboard movement was pretty mind-blowing. How did you yeah. come up with that? I, I just wanted it to feel natural and like just allowed myself timeless time, you know, drift time to think about what a cursor would mean in the 3D game and how it would be elegant. And so... I just came up with that. I just came to me and like, oh, you should be able to like guide it and it should depths uh, detect. And so you can just kind of like guide it and, and it will just, you know, select the thing it's on in 3D space and get smaller if it's farther away. Uh, but I think the real end, that, that's an animation. But I think the second animation was that I made the cursor a character. So the, one of the things I love to do is make things you don't expect to be alive, alive. So like in Commander Keen, you have like little health, health things walking around, little vivas and stuff like that. Um, and um, so in this, you know, there's actual character inside your cursor, you know, kind of comes out in holographic form and is, you know, complaining to you in your, in your journal and stuff like that. So uh, it was charming to be able to make that an unexpected character and then like a cool element to 3D space. 
And from a technical point of view, what motivated the decision to use a modified version of the Quake 2 engine for the game's development? Well, we had started in Quake 1, but Quake 2 came out with color lighting, and we knew that would make a, the game a lot more vibrant and futuristic and so on. So we, we kind of moved to the Quake 2 engine. But we had to, at that point, you know, freeze the technology and just make the game. Uh, and so, I mean, that was as good a technology as we could start with at the time we had to lock in the technology. So uh, it's maybe low poly, but we really leaned into low poly and kind of like zoomed in, you know, bravely into, into its like low risness. And it was kind of like hilarious to like, you know, just kind of inhabit that, you know, technological world as well as you know, uh, the reality of what they were. There was a cut, segment where you were going into a digital world which was pal's home world and you were going to i may do this later maybe i won't say but you basically start with as a low poly person and you have to work your way up in society to be like a very high poly person to get you know to the to the people that you need to talk to or so what you're shunned otherwise so and what were some of the key lessons and takeaways from the development process of Anacronox? Um Hire experienced developers. I mean, everybody that worked on that became experienced developers by the end of it. But uh, it took like three and a half, almost four years to get done. And it would have probably taken two and a half if we you know, hired experienced folks from the start. I mean, every... I, Everybody working on that, they're all like, you know, very close friends of mine. And we still like meet at every GDC for uh, the Anachronix dinner. Um, but but I think that company as a whole, I mean, I think that we, we did look out with really talented folks that were, you know, gems in the rough. So like uh, we had a great writer and an amazing director and, and programmers that really like or surprised us with how good they were. Uh, but not the whole company, you know, got that. Uh, and, and so that kind of like hurt our company hired. We just wanted to give everybody a shot, you know, and we should have like hired people that would train the lost junior people and so on. So it kind of like just slowed our development uh, a good bit. And also making Final Fantasy seven level game with 15 people was hubris that I should not have taken on. <laughs> <laughs> and what was your reaction to the game's critical reception? I mean, um, I thought it was great. I mean, I th except that we, they put, made us push it out the door. So it had some bugs. So that knocked it down a little, a few points. Uh, but we fixed those bugs uh, after the fact. Uh, which is not like it is now, you know, like, oh, here's your update 1.1. 1 .1. Like, it's, it was just like, that was harder to do back then. But um, I think it told a grand story and it got uh, one uh, site gave it RPG of the Year and then one PC Gamer Best Writing and Best Use of Humor. Uh, so that, that, was, that was a great response. So I mean I'm I'm damn proud of what we got out there uh and and it had a lot of really great innovations and just a hilarious hilarious story which some of which you can see in the Anachronix movie which is Jake put out on the, the internet and uh and but it is missing some just hilarious in-game moments that are just I mean it, it's rare that the games can just make you laugh out loud and even though I know the jokes, they still make me laugh out loud. Let's talk about Hyperspace Delivery Boy. All right. It, it's sort of like the, the ancestor of, of Rescue Rover. Mm -hmm. uh, we, were just, we were just doing like mobile games. You know, we were trying to be the, one of the first phone game companies. And so we were doing like little things for brew phones and stuff like that and, and PDAs. And so that design seemed simple enough to do on, on uh, the sort of primitive early proto phones. Uh, you know, the, the phones hadn't merged with PDAs quite yet. So that was a concept we did of that. And it was really fun to make. And we had a hilarious time making it. And there's a lot of fun secrets in there. There's a dope fish in there, you know, like... 
And it was fun just to get back to the sort of the puzzle fun that uh, Rescue Rover was. So back then, given that you worked on mobile games and the, the mobile phones at the time didn't have the computing power they have nowadays, they were more along the lines of what computers were back in the early 90s. So were you excited by the fact that you got to restart working on games that you were able to work in the early 90s? Or did you feel like now that you know what you can do on a PC, did you feel that it limited you in some way that you have to adhere to the limitations of the Engage and, and the Brew and the other mobile phones? I think it was just like, we love uh, being on the forefront of technology. And having something in your pocket uh, that you can play games on is great. You know, uh, that was like so new back then and like a crazy concept. And like just seeing, just making the first inklings of that was exciting. And and a publisher kind of delayed, uh, delayed payment to us, which eventually kind of like hurt the company too much. And we kind of had to close down and get real jobs or whatever. Uh, and that happened six months before the iPhone came out. So we would have been like the primo developers with great mobile experience. And, and that would have been fantastic, but it was not to be. And then he also worked on browser games like Paddington Park in 2012. Yeah. What can you tell us about that game? Uh, th those were fun to do. Um, although that, that got on a, that was like relegated to like Google Plus, which really hardly anybody was on. And, and that was unfortunate. I was on was Google Plus. Play. Yeah, great. Uh, and it's still like a, a drink bottle with the Pedic Park in it. But uh, I mean, I loved that game and it was really fun to play. And, it now doesn't exist because there's nothing to run it, unfortunately. But uh, I think it was uh, like a cool, innovative step. So you essentially made sort of a space, and then uh, part of the things you made the space were little fun games that you could actually play and, and sort of earn stuff. Uh, so that, it was really fun to make, and it was really charming. It was cute. Uh, but again, this, those, all the games we made at that company are just now lost of time. That's kind of sad. So I don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> like like making games that you can actually play later, which is really cool. And in 2016, you worked on the Android game, Gordon Ramsay Dash. Yeah, it was, he was fantastic to work with. I we worked on like a number of Dash games and we said, oh, what, what if we, you know, sort of got or visibility with pairing with celebrity and and I sort of did an analysis and the company glue is doing their own thing with like you know celebrities like Kim Kardashian and stuff like that but I did an analysis of who has social media presence and and tons of followers and if you look down on like all the Twitter and all the Facebook and all the Instagram and sort of analyze all the social media platforms only Kim Kardashian and Gordon Ramsay have widespread media. Mm -hmm. There's the two two people that are present, and they both have TV shows. That was the important one. And so, so part of them, they were actually going to make a deal, a game with somebody else. But they said, "Well, if you can make a pitch in one day, you can get it to us. Then we'll consider you." So we just busted ass all day made a, this great pitch for a game and they went with us and so uh it was really weird i got to like write a script direct and act with gordon ramsay you know yeah, usually i'm just typing in a room and then suddenly oh it's like you know i like got to be in the room while people are doing voice acting for a game i was working on with like david dick company and marilyn manson or something like that which is who is not cool now obviously but uh, but uh, how weird you know, you're just in a room and then eh, famous for him. eh that's weird. But uh, but he was hardworking. He was great to work with. He says just direct me. I get directed every day. You know, <laughs> and this is like okay. And 
And so he's just happy to read everything. Uh, and and uh, fun, it's super fun to hang out. He jokes all the time. And he's a very generous person. He's like like really solid. He's just like, I'll take care of you. Don't worry about it. You know? And, and it's, it's really cool working with that guy. Uh, he's, he's not the screamer. I mean, when he's in something he's in responsible for, well, in, not in, necessarily in character, when he is like, doing something that has to be good because he's responsible for it. Like he says, you guys do games, you just, you know, you're responsible for that. But when it's something that he, like if he's on stage or he's making food or something and he's responsible, everybody better be doing their stuff. Great. <laughs> that's what he, that's when that, you know, boss mode is on and it's like, you better be doing the best you can do and don't mess up. Uh, and it's just because he cares about the quality of the product. You know, it's, yeah, I care about the food I'm making, you know, like I know my craft. And so yeah, I don't, I don't blame him for that. But, but when it was our responsibility, we're the serious folk and he's just ha- having a lark, you know, <laughs> and he was like super fun to work in. So you didn't get yelled at by. No, I, I Gordon. had him yell at me. In the script, so I could get yelled at by Gordon Rums. <laughs> yes. In 2019, we all had to witness a potential revival of Commander Keen in the form of a questionable mobile game. What was your initial reaction to the announcement, and were you glad that it was eventually canceled? Um, well, I reacted on, I mean, it was exciting initially to see, like, oh, you know, somebody you know, picked up the license and was going to do something with it. Uh, but then I watched it and then it was just sort of tacky shock animation and the dope fish looked stupid. And like, it was, it was just like, wow, you know, like you don't get commander keen, like do that with some other IP like that. This is not commander keen. And, and so I just voiced, I just said, that's not commander, commander keen on Twitter. And that was probably part of the reason that sort of the watershed, like if the original creator doesn't like it, you know, like obviously the, and it just looked like it wasn't commander keen gameplay. Really. It was like weird mobile yeah, weird mobile. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't even, you know, like if it would, if they would have figured out a way to translate it, like, you know, like Mario did or something, maybe, but, but uh, yeah, it was just, it was really disappointing that someone didn't get it, you know, and, and, and changed it that much. So let's talk about Pika Wait. Yes. It's awesome. Get it. <laughs> There's an educational version that you can use on the web. It's free. <laughs> um, so um, it's a fantasy console. You can make easy little games with it, you know, like say a Pac Man or, you know, Galaga or, or something like that. And you can get more, sort of more advanced with it, but you have to keep things small. And, and the fun thing about it is you can play in it. And if it doesn't work out, you can just throw it away because it's not too many lines of code or it's just a few graphics. You could lose them later or whatever. So it's, it's fun just to noodle around in and it keeps your projects really small and it's in lieu of scripting language. So it's really easy to, to code in. So like if, if there's kids out there like working in scratch, this would be a good next step. It's like a little, you can do more real games and it's not as had holy. I mean, scratch is cool because you can drag stuff and drag commands in and kind of change them and stuff. This you have to type in yourself, but all the tools are built in. So there's no friction to making. So I highly recommend any game developers out there try it out because you can just exper- like experiment with, you know, the balance of a system or experiment with a little game mechanic before, you know, like you use a bunch of assets and make a 3D or whatever. It's, it's just a great tool to just have fun with. So if you, if you like making games for fun, this is literally the most fun you can have with the least effort possible. It's, it's just a blast to play with. And do you use it? I, I yes, and I'm running a game jam this Christmas called Toy Box Jam. Yeah, so basically, you, I give you graphics, sounds, and music, and you can do it in Picaway or Unity or Godot or whatever. Uh, I give them in just in Picaway form, and I give them in just regular, you know, uh, ping form or stuff. 
And then you have to make a game with it. You can't make any new assets. You have to use those assets and you can recolor them as long as you don't have any de- add any detail to them. Uh, and people have a blast with it because it's freeing because they, they have to use those. So those constraints mean a, that they don't have to make anything. They can just make a game out of them and b that it, those constraints, you know, breed creativity. It's like, how can I make a monster out of all these weird pieces or that kind of thing? So people made like amazing fun little games. Plus in that game jam, there is a sort of uh, alternate reality game, an ARG. So this recluse developer is left behind some files and the original toy box jam, it was like the assets for the game or his unused disc he left behind, but he sort of reappeared and still mysterious. And so he makes kind of a little puzzle for you to solve. And if you solve those puzzles, you get more assets to make games with in the jam. So it's kind of fun little thing to do for like half an hour or something and you get more assets. And then, so it's both a jam and a little kind of fun puzzle for you to solve. And it's two weeks. So you could, th- you can jam over the weekend or you can take the whole two weeks over the holiday. So I'll try to premiere this conversation probably around the same time. So hopefully people will be able yeah. to join in. Even I yeah. can join in, but I'm using Phaser. Click the link down, yeah, click the link down below, and I'll also give you the link to Alfredo's Stupendous Surprise, so you can link to that too. Do it! You want to have fun? Come do it! Lots of people are having fun. You're missing the action. <laughs> I always try to join as many game jams as I can, but eventually I don't have time for them. I had, during the pandemic, I took Two years in which I decided to create one game a month. Yeah. As sort of a personal game jam. I called it yeah. 25, 25 to life because the, the pandemic felt like 25 to life. Yeah. And yeah. in the end, I created 25 games in 25 months. Fan, fantastic. Well, you probably could have made 50 if you're in peak weight. <laughs> but that's awesome well, that you did that. It's, like, it's sort of like Sock Pop Collective. They do like game a month kind of thing you know the, cool. the the thing the thing with uh, one game a month is that with each and every one of these games i left the the production of the game to the last day of the month so eventually i'd work like the full last day to get that game out there yeah i know it's just like for some reason like oh i can get this last thing in oh i can you know uh, that's it's like uh, art isn't finished, it's abandoned. So like you want to get that last thing in there before it's real. And that's, that's the good thing about game jams. You have a deadline because every time I try to make a game without a certain deadline, then you always think about new things you can add or things you get bored of because you played with a game too much. And now that first level doesn't look that good or maybe the graphics aren't that interesting. So. The more you spend with your game, the the less likely it is that it will be released soon. Yeah, exactly. You scope down and finish. Like, if there's one piece of advice I give to all the young developers out there is like, scope down and finish a game. Finishing feels so good, and you can make a more complex game the next time, but just make 10 little bad games like uh, Robert Rodriguez in his book, Rebel Without a Crew says, make 10 bad short films. Don't show them to anybody, learn your craft. And then the 11th one, you'll do something interesting. So I recommend the same thing with games. It's like you need to just finish games and you'll learn so much by just make it scope down and just make, you know, like make Galaxian. Like that's more complex than you think. And if you can finish that, that simple little game, then then that is going to teach you how to make games faster than virtually any other method. Is, is make something simple. You know, make make concentration. Like make something as simple as possible and get a game done. And learning to get a game done is is the hardest thing to do. Like thousands of people out there with you know, like they they haven't finished their novel or they haven't finished their story or they haven't finished the game. Make it so small that you have to be able to finish it. Now, in your opinion, what are some of the challenges that you see facing the the gaming industry in the future? Well, I mean, 
everything, the technology is always changing. Like everybody is going to have to incorporate like some form of AI use into their job titles and you have to learn what that does. But always being on like the new technology, I'm excited about it and what it can mean as long as it's, you know, in the art side, it's not like, you know, stealing assets from people and stuff like that. Cause you know, part of the art of the team of making game are artists. And then I don't want their work taken without their, their choice. Uh, but I think that will get resolved and they'll we'll get to licensed versions of that, hopefully. Um, but as far as challenges, like the most challenging thing right now is back then it was hard to make games, but you, people would see the game you made if you made a good one. Now it's easy to make games and it's hard to get anyone to see your game because there's thousands out there. So the biggest challenge just for indies is, is anyone going to play this? You're going to work like one to four years on this thing and maybe, you know, a dozen people will play it unless you're good at marketing and really getting out there. So be prepared if you're you're not part of a bigger company to really get the word out and be clever about it and be aggro about it. Because like when you get into a creative business, it's like, you know, this much development work and this much, you know, getting people to see it and, and into the game and... and it's it's a hard hard thing like my partner's a photographer and then like so much of the of her work is just getting people to be aware her business exists if you had the chance to create a new commander king game today what would it look like uh well i mean it would and there'd be some things that i planned for the original one uh with sort of cleverness of perspective and so on but it'd be yeah 3d but retaining the charm of you know what made it pure and fun and platformy so i mean if you kind of mushed super mario odyssey and together with super mario wonder or something it would be in the zone of that uh but i'd, I'd have to come up with a sort of an interesting twist like nintendo does like a a new thing that really kind of threads through the whole thing to make it fun but the end of it would explain why there's Commander Keens in Doom at the end. Mm -hmm. That's because of uh, <laughs> the fact that they're related. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can't tell you why, but it would explain it. As someone who's a gaming icon and who's been a huge part in forming the world of games as we know it today, do you enjoy watching movies or tv shows about the early years of gaming movies like pinball the men who saved the game tetris and tv shows like halt and catch fire yeah yeah it's yeah it's interesting to see like sort of dramatizations of you know like people were just like dudes you know or dudettes that were <laughs> that were near us you know or or you know like made games that we were fans of and so on like that so that those stories are always interesting it's just that uh you wonder like you know what has been dramatized for purposes like they were doing the masters of doom series which kind of didn't get anywhere or something but i was like the tragic you know, story like or it's like no you know and then and i was afraid they were going to make really bad jokes you know because i have a sense of humor they were going to make you know cloyingly bad jokes you know because that's what that sitcom character does kind of and you know it's just sort of like you know things get polarized because of the way people want to frame their story and which i understand as a writer like you sort of have to do like, I wonder what more nuanced story there is, you know, beneath the stories that were being told. Now, we've seen a plethora of remasters over the years from basic emulators that enable you to run the original game on modern machines to cosmetic enhancements like widescreen support and controller tweaks to, to complete revamps of the games. What, in your opinion, is the proper way to remaster a game while respecting its roots? Um, probably the, I mean, if you want to see a great way to remaster a game, uh, just go look at Digital Eclipse. Like, that is fantastic. The job they did with Atari 50, uh, both honoring the original titles and then adding amazing sort of combo titles like Vector Sector, 
I recommend playing Vector Sector. So you play it and you're playing like, oh, I am playing, you know, like asteroids. And then you finish the asteroids level and all of a sudden the ship goes like this and you're playing Lunar Lander. And then the ship goes like this and you're playing a 3D racing game in vector graphics. And then you zoom up and you're in the tunnel of ten- Tempest. And it's sort of like just playing with the fabric of what 3D vector games were like, you know, and, and, and seeing stuff, you know, sort of drawn with those oscilloscopy lines. Uh, it, was, it was fantastic. And it just, it just really honored and told the deep stories of all the different games, the history of them. And then they did the same thing with the making of... Karateka. That was, was just really cool, and I was honored to be in that talking about you know the the joys and frustrations of that game. Uh, brilliant game, though. It just like really sort of changed the nature of what you thought you could do on those early early computers. So that that's the kind of preservation and, and honoring of the original games that is fantastic. Is like here's you know enhanced things around them and here's what they really were at the time like they just did one on wizardry one of them that was one of my foundational games and you can still see the original wizardry window because they're running the original code there but then they have the awesome 3d new view of it that's looking more like legend of grimrock or something so that that's a really cool way to like make sure it's still doing what it did, but showing you what it, what was in the mind of the creator back then. That was, that's amazing. Now, before I conclude our conversation, I have a few questions from our viewers. All right. Tomer Munford asks, the wolf characters in Commander Keen 1 gave me nightmares. I guess he's talking about the Vorticons. What was the, your inspiration for this character? Um, I, I just thought... Uh, drew up a bunch of aliens and those kind of were dog like uh, i guess and and are wolf like and and uh maybe they give you nightmares because adrian drew them really well like when i drew them they were very poor but when he got to them they were gorgeous uh so like there's you know really primitive ones and then and then all of a sudden there's these really cool sprites that die in 3d, you know? And, and so, so, uh, I'm sorry they gave you nightmares, but, uh, they it's a, it's a blue weird alien dog. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> they, they, they just a pixelated they, blue alien. Dog. Yeah. And they turned out not to be evil. So sleep well now. <laughs> Rafael Benari asks, what do you think would have happened if Nintendo let id develop Mario for the PC? Who knows? Like, either we have become Rare 2 or worked at Rare or, or something. But, I mean, making a Mario and being in sort of making one of the classic characters, that would have been like a, a big honor for sure. And maybe it would have uh, sort of become its own sort of like Nintendo platform on the PC. And we would have been at the forefront of that. So who knows what would have happened? I mean, who knows if the conversations would have happened, you know, but that's all shoulda, coulda, what have. So. <laughs> Julian Shikui asks, reflecting on your journey in game development, what advice would you share with your younger self as you embarked on your career in the gaming industry? Publish your text adventures. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I probably would have had plenty of dough. And, but then if I had done that, then I probably wouldn't have, you know, been part of the founding of id and making the first, you know, Commander Keen and making the first first person shooter. So in essence, I, I don't think I'd change a thing, really. I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I got so lucky to to hook up with people that were so great at their jobs and let me be great at mine and that was you know that's one of the coolest things you can do in gaming is is that kind of freedom so i i don't think i'd change nothing but but i wish i had gotten professor lubert's guide to the apple ii because it would have made my development on the apple ii so much easier and one last question for me. What are your plans for 2024 and how can people stay in touch with you and your work? So, uh, 
I am current. I just uh, had uh, three years at Resolution Games, a great VR AR company, and they're doing amazing stuff. Uh, and right now, I am doing a secret job on a secret project, which is secretly going really well. And you can see what that is later. But for now, uh, on social media, I'm that Tom Hall everywhere. So just Twitter X, you know, Instagram. I'm on Threads, but uh, we'll see if people go to Threads and blah blah. But yeah, it's anywhere. Also, that Tom Hall on Itchio, which is where my Pequot stuff is, and uh, I'm running Toybox Jam, which you'll probably see in a link below later. This December fifteenth. Be there. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Tom, for taking time to join me for a conversation today. It's been a true honor. Yeah, thank you. thanks so much for inviting me. It was really great to talk to you and, and some really deep cut questions. I appreciate that. And thank you for all the games. As a point and click adventure game fan, I realized that most of the non adventure game games I played had you in some form in the creative side well th well thanks for that you're welcome uh and, and weirdly anachronox kind of deep down is a graphic adventure game kind of what you're actually doing is secretly kind of like that kind of game so one more <laughs> all right thank you bye everybody